for coming to watch yet another episode in which I talk about issues relating to public transportation. And uh, following through on what I talked about last time, which was New York, uh, I would like to talk about a different issue from New York to Georgia, which is the biggest railway station in the city, in fact, in North America, which is New York Penn Station. This station uh, is uh, a key of any kind of regional rail system in the city, and moreover, it is also it also by far the busiest intercity rail station in the United States. Uh, and so uh, questions about what to do with it abound, mostly because the uh, current station is very unpopular. Uh, it is very cramped. Uh, the passenger user experience uh, is lacking. Uh, thanks for watching, Crane. Um, and uh, moreover, uh, there's also a, a bad history there that I want to uh, show people. Uh, Penn Station used to be um, on the outside, okay, uh, not Penn Station because there are many stations called Penn Station. Uh, so let's look at Pennsylvania Station, the original one. Um, this is how it looked. It was, um, near, it was this beautiful neoclassical building, uh, very roomy on the inside. And uh, it was demolished, as I mentioned, remember, 1910 to 1963. Well, something happened in 1963. And you can kind of see, I'm going to scroll a little bit. So, I mean, I guess my head is on the right, so there's less to see. But um, so this is soon before its demolition. And then there was a mentality in which the new is better than the old. It was demolished in the 1960s uh, and was replaced with something that looks like this. Um, now this is one of the, this is actually one of the better parts of the station in terms of uh, interior design. There are way worse parts of it. The current station is, uh, and you can see some of the article, they're, they're literally calling it a catacomb. Despite having a little, the station is credited as a low sailing catacomb lacking charm, uh, especially when compared to the larger and more ornate Grand Central Terminal. Um, 100% correct. Uh, this is as the station as it used to be, uh, with lots of, again, lots of air, lots of space. The um, high ceilings, uh, which are pretty uh, standard tool of like making a space feel like you're less cramped. Next time you're at a very large airport, uh, try to notice something that the big hallways of the airport never have ceilings that are the height of your apartment. They're going to be a minimum double height, often triple or quadruple height. It's a pretty standard thing in big waiting halls as well, um, just to make it, I mean, it's not because you're, it's not like you're actually going to fly and all the people are at ground floor. It's just, it's a way of making the space feel less cramped. But the current Penn Station does not do that. And uh, so between the bad user experience and the fact that there's lots of lots and lots of trains there, um, there are various proposals for changing it. Now, uh, here is actually a pretty, uh, a pretty common example of what the user experience is like. Now, it looks like this. Now, I used to be, I used to spend a lot of time here um, when I lived in the city, not because I used the station very much. Um, I lived in the city, not the suburbs, um, but I used it as a shopping mall. Um, and yeah, it is kind of plain and kind of grimy. Um, and there are people who are, turn at, who are connecting it with serious problems with... <gasps> Sorry, with serious problems uh, with the station's uh, uh, operations. So the passenger experience is not very good. Um, the rail operations through the station kind of suck. And there's the history of how it used to be a lot more ornate. So a lot of people are proposing uh, changes that usually uh, involve spending many, many billions of dollars on making it more ornate without changing much of the track level. Uh, so actually, the, there's actually a photo of such a thing, it's called Moynihan Station. Uh, they took the Farley Post Office that was uh, used to be adjacent to Penn Station, which used to be pretty common. Uh, how did mail get delivered before airmail? By train. And so Penn Station, uh, I should probably move my head because uh, Google usually puts the uh, stuff, uh, puts the side stuff on the left, right, like here. Um, so, Penn Station is this. 
block. Uh, it's between 7th and 8th, and between 31st and 33rd. Uh, and uh, then this block, you can see this also kind of a station building. It was not historically a train station. This was the post office. Um, so trains would come in, and the mail would get sorted here. Um, but because they never rebuilt it, uh, and the building still has the neoclassical facade, and you kind of can tell there are big steps leading in because uh, what is wheelchair accessibility? Uh, and they've kind of turned this part into a new Amtrak-only waiting hall, which uh, is very roomy. You might get tell from the picture there are no uh, seats in there. Uh, very common complaint. Uh, it's a kind of hostile architecture. Uh, seats equals homeless people uh, sitting there, maybe lying down there. So they figure that they might as well not have seats because uh, hostile architecture is more important to them than a uh, good user experience. Uh, and so so th this is kind of the aesthetic part of it, which is really the one that uh, is the most dominant. I've actually talked to Michael Kimmelman, uh, who's an architecture writer for the New York Times about this. Um, about and, and, and they talk about it from a very utilitarian, very form follow function type uh, angle uh, about how to make the station function better rather than look nicer or, or, or some kind of uh, weird MAGA return. Or, how, is it, how is this spell? Uh, how is this pronounced? Like, I know the like churches, like this band. Uh, this band, they just pronounce the name churches. Uh, but return, I don't know if it's return to tradition, whatever. You, you know what I'm talking about. The longing for an old time in which men were men, women were women, gays were required to undergo chemical castration until they killed themselves. Uh, uh, if the military was horrifically corrupt, and a journalist would cover how the military was underprepared for a Soviet invasion. The journalist could be put in jail for months. Um, uh, you had, um, the, uh, Nazis, uh, not Nazi collaborators, would be feted as uh, either important communists if you're in Czechoslovakia or as important anti-communists if you're in West Germany. You know, return, to, return to tradition. Yeah, so, uh, so, so there is that angle to the point that the Trump administration at one point had a, towards the end, uh, I think they did an executive order that requires all federal buildings to use classical forms where they do things like beaux arts, neoclassical, Victorian, kind of before World War II kind of architectural style and this kind of idea that post-war architectural styles are a communist conspiracy to sap and purify people's bodily fluids. Um, there is a little bit of that in urbanism and in rail advocacy, not much, and I think their importance is diminishing, but these people exist. Um, in, uh, um, in American as well as European urbanism. Uh, so, uh, so I think that is to some extent... Yeah, fair. Um, so, th so the Turkish tradition, again, it's a thing, and there are people who are trying to kind of undo some kind of historical injustice. By the way, the way you know that a place is um, terrible and incapable of meeting modern challenges is when it's obsessed over things that happened 60 years ago and not uh, about current needs. So we're going to talk about a Penn Station based on current needs. And it's, as I said, it's going to be very crayony um, because the most likely thing that is going to be done with Penn Station is nothing. Um, so Again, Penn Station, these are buildings that are on top of the station. This is Madison Square Garden. This is, I don't remember the name of this building. Uh, but the tracks are underneath. Um, and in fact, the track, now, if you, now, normally it's kind of difficult to build on top of railway tracks. Penn Station is a big exception. So Penn Station and Grand Central were both designed to potentially support a skyscraper on top. Um, now, this has not happened with Grand Central. Uh, I mean, there is a skyscraper a little bit behind, but this could also be a skyscraper. Um, but it's not. It's the main train hole. Nobody even thinks to make it a skyscraper because of the history of Penn Station. That's honestly it's fine. Um, and uh, and here this could also be done. In fact, it was done. Um, there's, so it's stuff with the column spacing. And there's a log on the uh, Let's go LA Air Rights Penn Station. 
there's this uh, engineer named uh, Let's Go. I mean, that's not. I mean, it, it, the, I mean, this person's uh, ID does not say "Let's go, LA," but they're a, uh, but, but they're an engineer who talks about uh, uh, mostly LA, but not just related uh, issues of uh, infrastructure. And uh, so, so this is the post about air rights, uh, and the point is that. Uh, normally, it's very difficult, uh, but uh, Penn Station is an exception. It's something to do with column spacing again, and Penn Stations were designed to support a skyscraper on top, which is how this exists. If you don't have that, for example, Hudson Yards didn't, uh, yeah, you can still build. You're just going to spend twice the, normal, the, the amount of money that you would spend on the same building on Firma, uh, which if you do not know the engineering lingo, it's... Uh, it means on firm land as opposed to on top of that, right? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of the historical preservation in the United States comes out of Penn Station. Not entirely. There was more NIMBYism involved than people realized. But yeah, Penn Station was a very important kind of watershed moment, which is, again, it's kind of a historical thing. that You, you can see that New York is very fast, is very backward looking because it still cares about things from the 1960s as opposed to building the city for the 2060s. So at any rate, um, this is Penn Station. Um, mostly this pair of blocks have turned into a super block. But there's also stuff in here. Uh, there are 21 tracks uh, flanking 11 platforms. Now, normally it goes platform between two tracks, so it should be 11 platforms and 22 tracks. However, uh, let's look at uh, not at maps of the subway. So th again, this is the footprint. It's 31 to 33. Note that the subway stops. Um, try to be more toward 34. So if you take the subway here a lot, which I used to, um, one of the things you know is that uh, the north exits, say to 34th Street, like here, and the southern exits go direct to Penn Station. Um, again, it's fine. It doesn't have to be perfectly aligned. That's okay. Um, kind of the north end of Penn Station is more important than the south end, just because there's more jobs in this direction than in this direction. Um, Peak employment in Midtown Manhattan is well into the 40s, so more people want to be, go north than south. Again, that's fine. Um, now, uh, again, it's mostly this block. This is a uh, block that they rehabilitated, um, and this is the subway. So let's not look at the subway, and let's look at the uh, mainline station. There are a bunch of maps that I found just before going online. This probably is the most technical and the one that is actually on top of um, a street map, which is very valuable. Now, uh, so you can see the 11 platforms, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. And you might notice this platform is uh, wider uh, and there's only one track here. So essentially this is a, there kind of should be a track here, but the track, uh, but that track is missing, and instead the platform uh, between tracks 18 and 19 is wider. The tracks, the track numbers rise south to north. Um, so, also we can see on this track map that uh, the southernmost tracks, those numbers one, two, three, and four, do not go through. So there are four tracks that go east of Penn Station, 220, uh, under 32nd Street and 233rd. Uh, and uh, the, all of this under 7th Avenue is one giant interlocking, uh, an interlocking that is very slow. This is something called, a, there's something called a ladder track, which is, I don't know if there's a better, uh, I, I don't know if there's a better depiction of a ladder track, where uh, the point, a ladder track is when you have an interlocking and one track uh Con has a bunch of turnouts in rapid succession, like here, where it's one where you, you see this pair of tracks, and uh, so the this track um, is southern of the two tracks under 33rd. You can kind of see it, it, it um, and also the northern one, to be honest, uh, has these connections, of, like they keep going to various uh, tracks on the platform. It's called a ladder track, and these are common in American 
common at American train stations, and they're very slow. Uh, typical speed is 10 to 15 miles an hour. Now, the right-of-way geometry is better than this, um, but this requires using more modern turnouts. The United States uses 19th century technology for turnouts. These are called secant turnouts because at one point the train changes azimuth abruptly uh, without even proper second derivative control. And uh, this is why when you're on a switch in the United States, you get thrown from side to side. It's a very rapid change in azimuth. Uh, Germany does not have that. In fact, most of the world adopted the German standards from the 1920s, in which you have second but not third derivative control. That is to say, uh, there is jerk, um, and that jerk does limit speed to some extent, but um, the uh, blades of the switch are thin enough that they form a perfect circular arc at the tangent point. They are uh, curved through the frog. Uh, let me find a railroad switch map just so that I can tell people what a frog is. Um, it's called a switch or a turnout. Uh, it, also, it can also be called points in British. I've never seen points in America. I've seen switch and turnout in the United States as well. So um, the uh, so this is a German one, but uh, the important so the frog is the part is this part, the part where um, so the part where the uh, diverging track uh, hits the straight track. This is called the frog. Uh, this is a straight frog, but in Germany frogs tend to be uh, Curved, so the curve of the switch here, this is the curve, uh, continues through the frog. Uh, essentially, it means that within the same footprint, you can get, I think, about the same radius, but you just get a much smoother ride. And as a result, the speed limits through turnouts in Germany are about 40 to 50 percent higher than in the United States um, in the same switch number. Switches are uh, so the angle of the so the angle through the frog is the number. So it's either called number something, like number 8 would be 1 to 8 in America, or number 9, or number 10. In Germany, it would be called 1 to 8, or 1, 1 to 9, 1 to 12. Um, and uh, so this is an interlocking thing that needs to be fixed in uh, the United States, uh, especially at constrained terminals. And uh, this includes both Penn Station and Grand Central. Actually, Grand Central is worse. And the reason Grand Central is worse, I don't know if it's easy to see this on maps with just Penn Station. Uh, but Grand Central has this problem, which is that you're not going to see this, so maybe it's not the best. Um, so there's Park Avenue, which is where the tracks go. And then around 59, they start fanning out to more than just four tracks. The interlocking begins and then becomes even bigger around the footprint of Grand Central. Um, and the point is that the last mile, roughly, so from about 59th or 60th to here, is done at 10 miles an hour. Uh, and... So this takes, uh, so this is something like five minutes or six minutes that could be done in a minute and a half uh, if they had better turns, which they can. Um, the footprint is very constrained, but again, the point of a curved frog is that it fits in a small footprint and also something that, and also because the train sways less um, on a less jerky ride, uh, it, uh, it means that um, for the same dynamical clearance, you can have a tighter static clearance. Uh, and this means that you can essentially create more space and uh, do something like a bunch of 1, one in 12, uh, or definitely 1 in tons. And when you do that, I mean, you can do um, something like 40 or 50 kilometers an hour. And then, yeah, the, and then, yeah, you're saving about 4 minutes. Like, trains from New York to New Haven could save something like 3 to 4 minutes in just this segment, literally the last mile into New York City. Now, Penn Station uh, is not as bad, actually, as Grand Central does. Um, I believe it's 15 and 10 miles an hour. Um, and also the switches, again, the interlocking is right next to the station. So already, by the time you hit here, um, a mile is about 20 blocks going north-south in New York City, in, in Manhattan. Going east-west, um, a mile is about five or cross down, or it's about five or it's about five to six cross down blocks. So um, the station's tracks and
hand here. And already here, um, so a fraction of a mile, you're going 60 miles an hour. So you can squeeze maybe, I think, a minute on each side, improving the interlocking. But again, it's not the four minutes you're squeezing out of ground central. Now, the problem is, of course, you have all, um, you have all these columns and they obstruct things. Um, so some of it is difficult to fix, and we'll get to this in a little bit when I start correcting them. Now, um, so, so, so east of Penn Station, and right, there are four tracks, 233rd, uh, 232nd. The uh, intercity trains use the southern tracks. The northern tracks um, are used exclusively by LAR arc trains. And this is, has to do with what happens to... Uh, oh, and, uh, and finally, there are four tracks at Penn Station that do not connect. Like they, There kind of should be a tunnel under 31st. When the station opened, they left open the ability to run under 31st, uh, which would connect to tracks number one through four, and then also with some switches to some of the other southerly tracks. Um, but um, this was never built. Uh, there were even some right-of-way intrusions in that um, 6th Avenue then got the path trains and then the subway. Uh, so they still can do it uh, using more modern gradients. They were expecting to do very gentle gradients for the era's electric locomotives. You should not run electric locomotives in passenger rail service approximately ever. You should just run self-propelled cars, a.k.a. electric multiple units, or EMUs. Uh, for example, uh, the Shinkansen is a good example. Let me see. If there, so here's a good one. Um, you might be able to say, you see how this is, so this is, let's say, a lead car. And you can kind of say that, yeah, the nose does not have seats. But th the reason there are windows here is because there are seats, right? So even the lead car is occupied and the um, traction equipment is underneath, is under the floor. So these are called electric multiple units. Uh, Nearly all high-speed trains are electric multiple units, including everything in China, Japan, Germany. Uh, I think the high-speed trains that are running in Russia are also uh, German EMUs. The only place that runs high-speed rail that is not EMUs is France, and so uh, and, and they like this and they're wrong. So you can see here, um, it may be not clear from this angle, but th these are not windows. This is just a power car. This is, this generates power. This one generates power. Behind them are unpowered coaches carrying passengers. This is how everything is to run. This is not how high-speed rail runs today, except in France. Um, this is not how subways run anywhere. Um, this is not how modern regional trails, uh, regional, uh, not regional trails, regional trains run. Uh, So, for example, this train that runs uh, in urban rail in Japan, not all the trains are powered, not all the cars are powered, but you can see uh, doors and windows, doors and windows, blah, blah, blah. some of these have traction power underneath, some don't. Uh, yeah, this is how a modern regional rail system looks. Like, maybe you have fewer doors if you're not Tokyo, and to uh, because Tokyo needs ton of egress capacity. Um, in Berlin, for example, there are fewer doors, and that's fine. Uh, but again, it's like this. The uh, cars are going to be self-propelled, um, which has an advantage. Um, because self-propelled cars uh, have better performance, and they can climb steeper grades in the same way that when you drive. I mean, probably should not be driving a car, but if you drive a car, you know how a 4x4 is uh, going to be uh, it's going to perform better off-road. It's going to accelerate better if one of the wheels gets stuck in like a little hole and the others can pull it out. So it's the same way. It's kind of like a 4x4 car. Um, and the nice thing about it is unlike a 4x4, it's not going to also consume more fuel. It's just better electrical efficiency. Um, and so the uh, and so this means that you can um, slalom between these subway tunnels um, on 6th Avenue, for example, if you go east of this. Um, now, the, there are these CRAN plans that go east. Um, the Gateway Tunnel, which I'm going to go to in a sec, uh, the, it's currently conceived, doesn't, but a lot of serious people have proposed variants, most of which suck, but, uh, but they do involve things happening with 31st um, Street. Often it's like a 5th and 6th track that go across uh, Manhattan and then to the East River, so you can, and maybe it's difficult to see with the faint colors, but there are two tracks, the 
could go here and another two tracks here. So there are four tracks between Manhattan and Queens uh, with a few outtracks per hour and many LIR trains. Um, now to the west, there's only one tunnel with two tracks. Uh, it is called the North River Tunnel because the, or North River Tunnels rather, because the old name for the Hudson is the North River. And the uh, North River Tunnels as you might expect out of like the only mainline connection between the mainland and Manhattan, they're very crowded. At rush hour, they run 25 trains an hour into Manhattan. Uh, there aren't a lot of places in Europe that run heavier traffic they exist. Um, in Paris, in Munich, I think in London. There might be a handful more, but not that many. Um, in Barcelona, I think they get 20. Um, and of course, New York is a much faster city than Barcelona. Um, but this is, so, so this is operationally very difficult, which is why the Gateway Project exists, to turn these two tracks into four. Um, now, the way this is going to work, and they kind of gave away a lot of the footprint um, on the Manhattan side for any other alternative, would be for the tunnel to come to the south of this. Uh, they, for some reason, don't work too closely parallel to the old tunnels. Um, and then it's going to enter Manhattan through here and go under 31st Street vaguely, uh, and mostly feed the low-numbered tracks, and then stub end. This is important because stub and tracks have less capacity to turn trains than through tracks if you just go through. Um, which is why a lot of older plans had plans to either add tracks through a uh, cavern, through maybe condemning more land to build more tracks, or going through. Um, now this gets us historically to the 2000s and the ARC project. ARC means access to the region's core. Now what is the history of ARC? Again, already in the 1990s they understood that they needed a third and fourth track um, across the Hudson. Uh, ridership was even there, very high, um, at rush hour at least. And so they had this plan, they uh, thought they could not accommodate the extra traffic in the 21 track footprint of, of Penn Station. Um, now 21 tracks is quite a lot. Now, to qualify this a little bit, it's 21 tracks, but um, the platforms are very narrow. The width of these platforms around, so you can say that the platform is somewhat vary in width. Uh, it's about uh, five or maybe six meters. Uh, moreover, the platforms themselves are obstructed, partly by columns, partly by um, poorly placed vertical circulation that has single direction escalators. Um, it's quite common. The upshot is that um, the, they're kind of cramped, but they also don't use the space that they do have very efficiently. Some of the stairs don't go straight, but they um, loop around and that reduces capacity. I don't, um, I don't know if they can, if you can see which ones it is on this map. Like maybe here, if, because it's a pair, I'm not sure, uh, where you go something like this. And, um, and so this uh, leads to demand for more tracks. People who run Penn Station, running it as a standard American mainline railroad based on Remember, I just mentioned before that the turnout geometry is from the 19th century, not even German 1920s law. Many things go back to the 19th century or the early or at most mid 20th century, issues of reliability, issues of timetabling. And the result is that they're very frantic. Um, so if you take trains in Germany or in Japan, or sometimes in France, you will notice something that on the ticket, the track number will be printed because they know in advance when the timetable of the train, which track out of Tokyo Station or Berlin Hauptbahnhof um, or, uh, or, or Gare de l'Est, the train will depart. And in the United States, it never happens. In the United States, um, you're told you're, that you have a train ticket from, let's say, New York to Boston or from Boston to New York, and then you're going to show up at the train station. You know your train number. Uh, and you know the destination of the train. The trains are not that frequent, right? Maybe they run every hour or something. So you know which train is yours by just the destination. It says Boston or Washington or whatever. Um, and uh, you are glued to the screen, gazing at it. Like I said, the screen is above your 
Avo, and then you're going to wait for the announcement of the track number, and then when it is announced, the tide of passengers rushes to the train to claim the best seats, because the seats in the United States are not uh, assigned. Um, in Germany, the way this works is, uh, so, so in France, the way it works is, you must reserve a seat. It will tell you the car number and the seat number. If, like me, you have motion sickness, you know you have a 50-50 chance of facing backward, and this is miserable. In Germany, you have the option of paying extra for this, and again, 50-50 chance of facing backward and being miserable. Or you can get a standing ticket, which means you go get on the train. If there's a seat that is empty and is not reserved by a passenger who paid for a seat, you just sit there, um, which is what I do in Germany. The trains are never crowded enough that I have to stand. Um, now, sometimes the trains do get crowded. Um, they will usually tell you in advance if they expect a lot of crowding. Uh, kind of infamously, uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, when she was traveling with her entourage um, to speak at various environmental uh, protests in Northern Europe, uh, she was uh, taking a train from Switzerland back home via Germany. And um, the train, I think, was canceled. So the next train was overbooked and she had to sit on uh, the floor for a little bit. Uh, and uh, and, kind of, and it made a lot of uh, publicity out of how the trains were overcrowded and there need to be better alternatives to the car and to the plane. And then Deutsche Bahn fired back. You booked a, a first class ticket. I mean, she did, but the first, it was a first class standing ticket. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, uh, so Deutsche Bahn, uh, it was not Deutsche Bahn's best PR moment. But uh, but at any rate, so in the United States, there are no standing tickets. Um, they will never sell more seat, more tickets in their seats, but seats aren't assigned. So people rush to try to get the best seats. Uh, and, there's a title, and there's kind of tied, and it's on both commuter trains, where, of course, they do. So uh, the, where they do, of course, sell more tickets than there are seats. Um, and on Amtrak, they um, uh, so, so you have this kind of tidal flow where it's really cramped, really stressful because it's a lot of passengers trying to get on the train at the exact same time. Uh, Penn Station also has a lot of agency turf, which I'm going to probably showing on one of these maps. I think this is the map for this. So Penn Station has two levels. They talk about... Uh, the upper level and the lower level. Um, let me see which so upper level Moynihan Corpus. So so upper level yeah okay upper level here, lower level here. Um, the LIR takes the lower level, which means that um, the, on the lower level the screens the departure screens only show LIR trains, and uh, the upper level is Amtrak as an Amtrak. Uh, hallway, which so which shows Amtrak and uh, New Jersey Transit, and a New Jersey Transit that, that only shows uh, New Jersey Transit. Um, and this means that you have to be standing here, so uh, it to to see where your train is. And uh, so it's not just that all the passengers get on the train the, at the platform at the same time, which is normal if the train only dwells there for two minutes, as is common in Germany, or one minute is common in Japan. It's not the not the fifteen at the Penn Station, but the, um, but there are many, but but whereas normally there are many access points to the tracks, um, just add these and those of the lower level um, of the same tracks. Um, instead, uh, all the passengers are shoved through one access point, so it's a very cramped line, uh, and this is a big user experience problem. Orig um, which now, if you're if you're a veteran rider, um, Matt Iglesias kind of told people how to do better uh, on Slate many years ago, um, and he did. And he told and it's not something he invented. A lot of people were doing. It. I think I was doing it before he uh, did it, but also it was before he was essentially outsourcing all his transport takes to me. Um, so the way it works is that um, there's a little screen here somewhere in the main concourse that will tell you when the train uh, arrives. Uh, and moreover, you can, uh, there's also a little screen that shows you the arrivals. So if you're on a train to Boston, this train arrives from Washington to New York and continues on to Boston. You know maybe the train number, so you can even verify the train number. And then see when your train has arrived, and then they will tell you the track number. Um, so when you do this, you can't go here because the, because the access points 
are gated, but you can go literally anywhere else. Now, not literally anywhere else, because if you're, so, so see, the New Jersey Transit Concourse is only tracks one through 10. So if your uh, track number is nine, then yeah, you can go here and then take this elevator down to track nine. But if it's track 14, then you can't because New Jersey Transit only uses the southern and southern middle tracks. The LRR is the exact opposite. It only uses the northern and the northern middle tracks. Um, and so remember, the LRR comes into Manhattan from the east, New Jersey Transit from the west. So the LRR will never use tracks one through four because they just do not connect through to the east. Um, and I don't think it commonly uses tracks five or six or seven or eight. It's mostly the middle and upper tracks. Um, and so, and, and likewise, New Jersey Transit is the opposite. The um, e the northernmost tracks, I think it's maybe just 20 and 21, maybe also 19, uh, don't even have connect through connections to the west. Um, again, New Jersey Transit is not going to use, let's say, track 16. Um, and track mine, New Jersey Transit. Mine. New Jersey Transit will use the, I mean, you can see the it's, the, it's these tracks, one through uh, ten, maybe eleven and twelve. Um, and so, if you're let's say on track fourteen, then what do you do? You uh, Penn, remember Penn has two concourses, an upper level and a lower level. So you go to the lower level, and then at the lower level, if it's let's say track fourteen or something or track sixteen, you take one of the many access points. There are many. There are a lot more access points on the LIRR side than on the upper concourse. And then, but, but you need to remember the track number because the because the screens will never tell you where to go. Not on the LIR level. That's the LIR curve. And, um, the, and, and likewise, the ticketing machines are separate. This is a problem. Uh, and so, but if you know where to go, yeah, the, there is track access and it's ungated. Uh, and a lot of passengers do that. Um, and uh, so, this is so this is a turf war, um, which needs to end. Uh, and uh, they should also have more uh, access to the low number tracks through these. Now, I do know that they've added some as part of Moynihan Phase 1, which I think is this part. Um, so I believe the West End Concourse only extended about here, and then they extended almost all the way down as uh, Moynihan Phase 1. Uh, and if you've been, this looks a little bit more modern, I think, than these. Um, Still very cramped, but the colors look like it's the 21st century, not the 20th. Uh, so this was a big project. It was like building, it's like extending these corridors. I think it was the central corridor. Um, um, was a big project actually in the 1990s, which was a big boon for the LIR. The LIR used to take a long time to unload at Penn Station in Russia, where it no longer does. Um, so this is something that could be extended for money. Things like extending the central corridor, uh, no, this is this is essentially part of the same complex as the NJ Transit corridor. It's like a half level. Like this is the this says the upper level, but the NJ Transit bit is actually kind of a split level. Um, so uh, the it's kind of an intermediate level. Uh, yeah, tracks one through four don't extend. Yeah, so the other issue is that um the track that the platforms are not always sufficiently long. So the middle platforms are very long. Uh, so they, maybe they don't show you everything here um, beyond a five, but the platforms that are used by Amtrak are long enough for, I think, 17 cars. So longer than high-speed rail platforms in Europe, which are 400 meters long, uh, by a little bit. Uh, but this is very uncommon. The United States does not run 16 car trains. I mean, maybe Amtrak runs some on... Uh, night trains where you have maybe multiple locomotives and then there's going to be a restaurant car and a lounge car uh, and a bunch of sleeper cars and a bunch of coaches and that they might be very long concepts. Oh, and there's a baggage car. Uh, and then you can also attach private cars uh, in the rear of the train uh, if you pay Amtrak enough money. Uh, but not on the Northeast Corridor. Northeast Corridor is unfortunately only eight car trains. They should be running 16 car trains um, for more capacity, but they don't. Uh, now, this is not a Penn Station related problem because they can already do so across the Penn Station infrastructure. But yes, uh, but, but yes, as, you, as, you, as we can see on the map, um, on the chart, the these platforms 
do not extend past a5. Um, and Moynihan is here. Uh, now, they can extend the other things here. So they can absolutely extend the central corridor this far, and they should. Uh, and now, I also think that they should find a way to extend these platforms a little bit, but you can already see that the, the ladder track is already coming here, and the um, columns make it hard. So, make, so extending this is not trivial, and, and honestly, it's fine. I mean, these, so the block between, so this is the kind of the block between two avenues, which is 800 feet. Uh, 800 feet is 240 meters. You can you can park a 10 car train here. Um, 10 cars is a lot. Uh, I'm trying to think what the longest commuter trains in Europe are, and I think the answer is R E R A. It's 225 meters, so it's I think it's set as a 10 car train, but it's about as long as a nine car train in the United States. Um, so 10 car trains is huge. Uh, Tokyo trains are rarely longer. Uh, Tokyo trains are set as 10 cars. Um, in Japan, uh, Shinkansen is standard 25 meters, but uh, non-Shinkansen is usually 20. So uh, it's 10 car trains, but they are as long as American 8 car trains on the busiest lines. Maybe sometimes, sometimes they go 11 cars. I think a handful of lines do 15, but maybe not even the lines you're thinking of. Not, not the Yamanota. It's, I think, the regional lines, like the um, Shonan Shinjuku, I think, is 15 cars, which, again, it's 15 cars, but it's Japanese 15, which is like American 12. Um, the LIR sometimes runs 12 car trains. New Jersey Transit sometimes runs 12 car trains. Um, this is fine. What you need is just better service. Uh, so, but at any rate, um, so there should be a, something here. All of my original rail, rail crayon not regional crayon. All of my regional rail crayon keeps telling people to do frip, 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 and then um, curve under. If you're deep enough with the tunnel boring machine, you go under the foundations of all these buildings, and then join under Park Avenue. You're deep under the subway, and then you emerge around here, and then you hit Grand Central. Um, so as I said before, these tracks uh, across the Hudson are very busy. They've, known, they've been very busy for a generation. So in the late 90s, early 2000s, they had an investment, a major investment study to look at how to do better. They thought that these are very cramped tracks that can't do more, even though they absolutely can. The uh, In Paris, uh, four stub and tracks on the RRE uh, can turn 18 trains an hour. They currently turn 16. Um, they have a lot more than four tracks, of course, here. Um, so you can absolutely do this and maybe also colonize track five and six or something, and then that's like another problem. Now, the uh, so instead they had plans for how to do not just Penn Station. They had three plans for ARC. Um, these were called Alt-P, Alt-S, and Alt-G. Um, I'm going to do Alt-P, which was the one that was chosen last, Alt, uh, because it's the hardest to explain. Now, Alt-G... Um, when I do crayon, essentially all of my crayon depicts something that looks like Alt G. So uh, let's show you guys. Where's my my regional rail, my regional rail crayon? Here. So this is the so the red line is the existing tunnel. Um, the orange line is the northern is is under thirty third and next to it. This is this is these are this is a real track. It just doesn't connect here, it connects to the low number tracks, like Fruit, and this is kind of a short tunnel for realignment. Um, green is gateway. By the way, the actual gateway project does not go directly here. Um, this is kind of schematic. The green, the line should kind of be, it's, it's kind of dipping like this uh, to avoid, so, and, and again, and again, it's not terribly flexible. The box that they put around here when they built the Hudson Yards building, so all of these, um, kind of force the tunnels to go in a very specific through a very specific box, and then they connect to the low number tracks. That's all plans, and uh, then uh, what I think they should have done was build. And then after Grand Central, you uh, not after, after Grand Station, you build a tunnel that goes roughly like this to Grand Central. Um, ignore all the other colors. Like this is like this crayon is not. From uh, and then run uh, New Jersey Transit trains through Metro North Territory and Metro North trains 
through New Jersey Transit Territory. Uh, this was essentially rejected on essentially agency turf grounds of uh, they don't like sharing New Jersey Transit slash Metro North. And there was Alt S. Alt S is uh, instead of is you keep going east, but you don't curve to Grand Central. You just add a fifth and a sixth track across the East River. S so Alt G is for Grand Central. Alt S is for Sunnyside. This is called so Sunnyside Junction is a station that does not exist, has no plans to exist, unfortunately, but should exist. Um, but the yard here is real, called Sunnyside Yard. So the plan is to go to Sunnyside Yard and park trains there. The alternative that was chosen does not add, uh, did not add um, any such tunnel, but it was called Alt-P for Penn Station because the trains would only go to Penn Station, and as a result, there would be a cavern built beneath the existing uh, train box for additional tracks. I believe there were supposed to be uh, seven, maybe eight tracks there. Uh, and uh, yes, I know I'm running out of disk space. And uh, and so, uh, li like with East Side Access, where the cavern adds eight tracks on the levels. Now, you ex as you can expect, adding tracks in a cavern, that's very expensive because you need to mine a cavern. It costs a lot of money. Uh, especially in New York, where everything costs a lot of money. It's not Stockholm, where they did, in fact, do that for their project. But why is... Okay, yeah, so the problem is that the recording is great. Um, let me see if I uh, have videos that I upload. Okay, these should not be on my computer. I uploaded them on Twitter, right? Um, sorry, sorry for doing this to you guys. Um, I, uh, let, me, let, me, let me check what's... Um, my YouTube, just to make sure that the things I'm about to delete are not things that will never be seen again. I just want to make sure that uh, it's that it, that it's all real. Okay, the problem is when I check along Levy YouTube, it is not me because along um, Levy, New York regional rail issues, how to model rail schedules and public transport fares. These were the things, and now I'm, now I'm literally recognizing the length, so I'm going to just delete all of these and uh, move these to the recycle bin. Uh, and this is the video that we're currently recording. No, I'm not going to delete any of this. I just deleted a lot more. Okay. Uh, so I did remember to upload before I uh, did this. It's just that I did not remember to delete the uploads. So anyway, let's go back to not me showing you all um, my legally obtained videos, but uh, talking about presentation. So um, alt P is a cavern. Uh, was a cavern. It, uh, the cost overruns in the 2000s concerned the cavern. Um, this was very unpopular among technical rail advocates in the region. Um, and between the unpopularity, it was called Tunnel to Macy's Basement because the cavern was so, was, was so deep. Uh, and the cost overruns and Chris Christie wanting to do something, he canceled the entire project. This is the origin of Gateway as it is. Gateway took the tunnel, removed the cavern, which was originally supposed to be a better project, uh, without a cavern, and then they added extras. The extra that they were thinking of was to take this entire block, 7th to 8th, 30 to 31st, uh, condemn it, and then build seven extra tracks in here for stop end purposes. Why? Because they don't know how modern rail operations work. Modern rail operations are that 21 tracks in this footprint are fully sufficient, right? It's four tracks going from to the east, uh, two from the west, and there's going to be four with Gateway. Um, you do not need 21 tracks for this, you need eight. Um, and maybe you want extra for the... Now, Amtrak does not want to foreclose the possibility of going east from these, um, under 31st or something, so maybe six tracks, which is fine. Six tracks to the east, six to the west, because it's four under the Hudson, and, the, uh, and you have this thing. Uh, so this is the Empire Connection. This, these trains lead to Albany. There were plans to also bring Metro North here, but they didn't go anywhere on, like... The plans to bring Metro North on the Northeast corridor, what's called Penn Station Access. 
um, let me just show you. It's just much easier to show on the crayon than anything else. Uh, the red line, so this is an LIR line called the Port Washington branch. This is uh, this is where Amtrak goes from New York to Boston. No other passenger trains use this particular line. All the passenger trains from New York to New Haven do this for Grand Central. But there are plans that are very close to completion called Penn Station Access to rebuild this entire line at very high expense and add four out of the six stations that I depicted, namely Co-op City, Morris Park, Park to Stern Hunt Point, and, and run some commuter trains like this to Penn Station, called Penn Station Access from Metro North. Um, so, uh, but, but at the end of the day, it's six tracks going east, frit, 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 six going west, frit, frit, frit. You do not need 21 tracks for this, you need 12. Generally, um, the way that uh, very complex stations work, uh, for example, Zurich, for example, the underground bits of Zurich for the S-Bahn, uh, or Stuttgart 21, is that one approach track becomes two platform tracks. Uh, and ideally, you want these two platform tracks to flank the same platform. So six approach tracks should be six platform tracks and 12, sorry, six platforms and 12 platform tracks. Um, so this is the analysis part, um, so the history of ARC and where we are today. The situation of Penn Station being very cramped and uh, and uh, I don't want to say deficient in egress points. At this point, it's no longer deficient. It was in the 90s, but again, when they built this and then they built this, um, it's better at this point. And even the New Jersey transit tracks, uh, one through four that don't have connections to others, they don't have a lot of egress points. It's one, two, three. Uh, and they believe this is also on. So they're, even they have not a lot, but sufficient egress, um, vaguely, uh, to clear trains at rush hour. Um, now, it's not, there's not a lot to spare, and this is a problem. On, the, uh, on, on these tracks, it's much better. Um, especially um, the problem is that um, mid, in the same way that Midtown is more north and south, Midtown is more east and west of here. So the exits near 7th Avenue are more popular than near 8th Avenue. Um, so you do want to have spare. Uh, this is definitely a thing. Um, but you don't need extra tracks. Especially you don't need extra tracks because um, condemning a block of Manhattan property is not free. Um, condemning, especially when you're just going to build tunnels underneath, I mean, that is billions of dollars that you're planning on spending. And yes, part of it is New York Coast disease, but the New York Coast disease is partly this kind of overbuilding. Um, so... Uh, let's see how much you want to expand. So this is where I'm going to look at the at the map that shows me the tracks on the street map very carefully. So the northernmost track, that's track 21, is this looks like the center point roughly of 33rd Street, and the southernmost track, track one, is, this looks like the box goes up until about the center point of 31st Street. Um, and uh, maybe a little bit more than that, right? Because center, this is not quite the center point, but there's a little bit of extra here, and the extra is going to be important for, like, safety zones, um, which otherwise we're going to have to add back in. Um, so if you're trying to extend all the way here, that's roughly another block. So it's, you're roughly going to be building this polygon from roughly, again, center point, I think, to either center point or just north of the center point. So this... Um, and it's going to continue maybe a little bit extra. Um, I'm going to randomly draw something and hope it's sufficiently second order that it's not going to. So this is 23k square meter. This is 23 dunams, 19 dunams. I should not say dunams. Nobody in English ever uses dunam. 23k square meters. Okay. Now, 23k square meters times the depth, this is supposed to be a deep station. So the current depth is 13 meters, but they want to go a little deeper, I think maybe 15 or 16. So we do that, um, it's almost 400,000 cubic meters. Now, this is an enormous dig. The stations of 2nd Avenue Subway, which are very deep, uh, in our mind also, um, are, I believe, about 120,000 or 130,000. The uh, train box for 2nd Avenue Subway, and I'm going to actually probably not talk around here. Uh, 
the train box at 2nd and 96th. This was built cut and cover, but the launch box was here, and also the two random geological issues, that is to say, um, they wanted to, uh, no, not 96th, 96th, they want to uh, hook into existing tunnels that were built in the uh, in the 70s at shallow level, starting at 99th, and they want to go as far as 92nd because the rock changes at 92nd, so they wanted to not have the tunnel boring machine deal with both the softer rock north of 92nd and the harder rock south, so they just built 92nd through 99th second cover. Uh, so seven blocks of cut and cover, 570-ish meters, about 25-ish meters of width and about 20 maybe or 25 of depth. Yeah, it's about this size. So essentially, uh, or 20, so it's something that's going to be about as complex, or even more complex than the launch box of second half of the subway. This was this was hundreds of millions of dollars. The anything that touches mainland rail in the United States becomes vastly more expensive. And uh, and and, uh, this, and it's much easier to build on the upper east side underneath the street and to condemn a block and build on a block in midtown Manhattan. We're um, the current budget is billions to do what is called Penn Station South. Uh, this is completely unnecessary. Uh, so let's talk about the existing footprint instead. What can be done in the existing footprint? The first thing is that these need to go. Um, they've been talking about uh, removing Madison Square Garden uh, for a while now, to the point that extending it late in 2010 or 2011 was somewhat controversial among area advocates. But that's going to run out. I think in a call. I think it was a 15-year extension from about 10 years ago. So that's running out. This, I mean, it's a building, but I mean, you can knock down buildings. I mean, it's not free but compared with Penn South. It is free. I'm sorry. Um, so you have this block to play with. That now um, you should possibly also do it in Farley, which is going to lead to a fit among preservationists because this is an old thing. The answer to most things is deal with it, but um, but you can also do. But the main block is going to be. The main box is going to be here and not here anyway, so here you're going to do a lot of reconstruction, but the real thing where you just where you should just bulldoze everything is here. Now separately, they should be bulldozing Moynihan Station and literally say the, and, and, and literally talk about the racist legacy of Daniel Moynihan, who essentially invented modern day American racism. This is a kind of side talk. Um, people do not I don't think people in the United States understand, first of all, that Moynihan was a racist. Um, because it was kind of weird, because it was also a, um, one of the first neoconservatives, that is to say, Democrats who were very bookish, uh, constantly brown-nosed um, Israel. Um, also very moderate. He was one of the people involved in uh, scuttling the uh, Hillary Care plans under the Bill Clinton administration in 1993, 1994. Um, but um, but the main thing is of uh, his, his early neoconservatism. Um, only later did it shift with the Republican Party, especially under Bush. But um, the uh, but also he was racist. And again, the Bush style neoconservatives were a lot less racist than the rest of the party. Um, the alt right, in fact, the reason they call themselves alt like alternative right is from a speech given immediately after the 2008 election by a uh, white supremacist intellectual. Uh, who uh, uh, who viewed his white supremacy as an alternative right to that of Bush and McCain, who were both very hawkish and uh, not especially racist in their in their governance, and so uh, so the alt right is both isolationist and, and like very and like loves foreign dictators uh, like Putin, and also very racist. Moynihan. Uh, Again, Moynihan was a neoconservative he, uh, in matters of, for example, foreign policy and attitudes, but he was also very racist. But it was not, again, but it was not an alt-right kind of white supremacy. It was a white supremacy that was very elite, very, I'm not racist, but, um, and actually kind of defines, I think, modern-day American racism. So, uh, yes, exactly. Exactly, Warners. Specifically, in the 1960s, there was a paradox, an apparent paradox. On the one hand, um, there was very 
obvious progress in civil rights. Civil rights bills were being signed. Black people were entering the economy. They were entering politics. Um, were you to ask anyone, is the black poverty rate down or up in the 1960s? They would say, oh, of course it's falling. It's much larger than the white poverty rate, but it's falling. And that was correct. There was a large decrease in the poverty rate in the United States in general, but especially for black people. Um, but the crime rate was rising. So despite the fact the United States had a very strong economy in the 1960s, um, again, large decreases in poverty, large increases in per capita income, uh, and inequality, by the way, uh, slightly decreased. Um, the big increase in inequality in the United States was the 1980s, 90s, and the 1960s, there was a very small uh, decrease, actually. Um, so it was not that there was growth, but it was not going to poor people. There was No, there was a lot of income growth uh, among the poor, um, especially among poor black people. And yet the crime rate was rising. The black crime rate was a lot higher than the white crime rate. Uh, I do not know to how much higher it was. Um, I mean, I know that today it is higher by a factor of, I think, maybe one point, I, somewhere between 1.7 and 2. Uh, and everyone thinks it's a lot higher. Um, people who, like when I tell people, oh, you know that the black crime rate is a lot less than what you think. For example, this is the white crime rate. The black crime rate is one of my followers on Twitter. I ask this, uh, I, I ask this and guess the factor of three. It is not a factor of three. I do not know what it was in the 1960s. I know that the black to white crime ratio decreased in the 2000s and 2010s, but I do not know where it had been before. Um, at any rate, um, there are a bunch of explanations. Now, the explanation that I think is the most relevant um, is twofold. Uh, it is a combination of what's called the old left narrative and the civil rights narrative. The old left narrative is in a book called When Work Disappears. This is, it was intended, I think, as a class critique, but is actually an urbanist critique, which is why I feel more confident talking about it here. Um, in the 1950s, famously, were when mass American suburbanization began. Uh, now, beforehand, there was already higher income suburbanization, the sort of people, foreigners, you and I would call middle class. Um, and then in the 1950s, it was the sort of people who the Americans would call middle class. It was just much more normalized. Whereas in the 1920s, um, it was more of an uh, upper middle class elite, like top 10% type phenomenon. By the 1950s, it was ubiquitous. Uh, and moreover, even urban communities within the United States that had, that had not participated in the 1920s suburbanization at all, like the ethnic whites, the Jews, the Poles, the Italians, uh, they assimilated to Wasp America and moved to the suburbs. Uh, now, this was residential sport. Um, you were supposed to still work in the city. So you would commute to the city by commuter rail or by car. Um, and then there would be jobs in the suburbs for very local things, and they became more common as, let's say, retail became uh, more suburbanized with the invention of Walmart in the early 1960s. Um, but the other thing, and it was not in the 50s, but 60s and 70s, is the uh, is job sprawl. So first of all, the people moved out of the city, and then the jobs moved out of the city. And specifically, the jobs that moved out of the city relative, um, relatively early were the industrial jobs that could support not so much a black middle class, okay, sorry, what Americans would call a black middle class, and what we in Europe would call a black, um, I don't know, no, I don't want to say working class, but um, the higher ends of the working class. For example, unionized labor, uh, which was very either public sector or manufacturing. At this point, it's mostly just public sector because very little is left of unionized manufacturing. Um, now, the unions themselves, of course, were very racist. Now, uh, and this is important because the uh, uh, because, for example, the trades jobs stayed in the city. New York City did not depopulate. New York City in 1970 was at population peak. Um, the big declines in New York City population were in the 1970s, and even that was about a 10% of population. The city went from 8 million to 7 million. It's not Detroit. Um, it's not St. Louis. Um, of course, Detroit and St. Louis did depopulate, but it took a while. But um, the trade jobs that were well-paid working-class jobs were generally closed to black people. Um, the trades in New York to this day remain very segregated, very white, very male. Um, it, now, I, now, there are there are signs of change. There's something called non-traditional employment for women, I think. 
I want to say I want to say it's N-E-W, but maybe I, I'm forgetting the exact acronym. In, that tries to play swimming in these jobs. Actually, I know a black woman um, in in New York uh, that I um, that I know through um, through gaming, uh, who, through like gaming conventions, who um, told me years later, "Oh yeah, I'm doing this non traditional employment for women thing, and I'm turning as an electrician." And yeah, it's five years of apprenticeship. And um, but this is rare. It's mostly very white male things. Um, so this is a civil rights theory. So the jobs left the city, specifically the kind of unionized, not trade jobs, opportunities, but manufacturing jobs, the industry jobs. Industry in the 20th century became very land intensive, uh, not uh, the kind of like satanic mills or the, the really cramped factories with like the pistons, but uh, very roomy uh, places that are uh, usually single floor. Um, so and uh, and then um, supplied by a uh, truck. So it started moving out of the city, and this accelerated in the 60s. Uh, the new office parks left the city. So it's, so, the, the, so jobs specifically accessible to poor black neighborhoods suburbanized. They left city center, and where did they leave? Not in the direction of where black people were living, no. They left in the direction of the middle-class suburbs. Um, so um, logistics jobs may move in any direction, but, um, but, but the better jobs, the things that would let's say the things that would be even vaguely middle class by our European standards uh, left usually in the direction of the rich suburbs. This is kind of created a, this kind of created directionality. This was not a purely American phenomenon. France has the same thing, uh, and uh, and I think people in France vaguely understand the urbanist connection. If anything, I think people in France overrate the urbanist connection and underrate the issue that there's just a lot of racial discrimination in France. But in France, the, the way it works in Paris, for example, is rich people, poor people. Or rather, rich people, like rather uh, south and west, and then poor people, northeast. Um, and where are the suburban job clusters that you've heard of? They're not here. They're not in the sense that, I mean, there is a little bit in San San Diego, where me wrong, but La Défense is here, west. Um, and in general, the jobs are more west than east. So it's harder to access the jobs if you're east, especially if you're not straight east and then you have the RER that goes limp, but if you're, let's say, this part, like northeast, San San Denis, because then you have to go... Um, and so there's just worse job access. So um, in these specific communities, unemployment is high due to a combination of discrimination, which did, of course, decrease markedly in the 1960s in the United States, um, but not to zero, to anything near zero, um, and the job access just decreased. So there was a lot of long-term unemployment. So, the, and so in one specific community there was, and this is what happened. So this is the civil rights explanation, which is the one that I most grabbed. So sorry, sorry, this is the um, kind of old left explanation. Um, uh, then there's the civil rights explanation, which centers police brutality. So, um, the, so um, for example, John Griffin talks about it in Black Like Me. Um, for people who don't know, Black Army is a white civil rights activist named John Griffin who uh, uh, took some kind of medication that uh, darkened his face so he looked black uh, and just uh, went around the South to see how people treated him. And the answer is like shit. And, uh, and at the time, I mean, it was considered a kind of an ally thing. And, and he would say in a, in a quota to the book that uh, people that, that um, people in various cities he talked about uh, after he published the book, were a lot more willing to hear about racial problems from him than from actual black people. Um, now, today, if someone tried to do that, he would be called a racist, and you, know, and you shouldn't say he because this person exists and her name is Rachel Dolzo. Um, but um, the uh, but in this again, in this case, we're different. I mean, in the sixties, if you say I support I, I support the right of the Negro. Uh, this, this was a civil rights thing to say, and if you say today, people will say, people will look at you as scans because nobody that says this side of nineteen sixty eight says the word Negro unless they're very racist. Um, and so, um, so what he pointed out is the race riots specifically um, involves a lot of police harassment. So black people were entering the northern cities in large numbers in the nineteen forties, fifties, and sixties. White people were leaving. So this is not job sprawl. This is um, racial change. The police departments stayed very white. Um, so all right, so usually the riots were happening around the time when a city became majority black, but the police force was overwhelmingly white and had a 
kind of uh, adversarial relationship with the community. And, uh, uh, and often uh, they were fomenting the right. Yes, there's the Lois Lane bit where she, uh, where she uh, becomes a black woman. Yes, there is that issue. Yeah. Uh, and I've never read any Superman comic, but I still know that this thing exists. This is, yeah. So, um, uh, so anyway, with, uh, with what happened, so, so the civil rights revolution is that a lot of it is the police um, fomenting riots. This is a little bit what happened in uh, Minneapolis, actually, in 2020, when um, there were peaceful protests against, the, uh, against yet another police killing. Uh, and the city actually reacted pretty well. The cops were fired, and very unusually, later, the um, offending cop, who was caught in camera, you know, strangling uh, George Floyd to death uh, for minutes, uh, was actually convicted. But um, as soon, as, but but I believe he and the other three cops involved were fired immediately, and the police essentially fomented the riot. Essentially, that what they did is they, uh, uh, is they kept, um, uh, is they kept inciting, they kept, um, uh, um, they kept, I don't know what the word for late God is in English, honestly. They, they kept essentially asking for it, like, like um, ha, ha, ha. Like, in, in the same way that um, when you're in a fight and you keep, uh, and, and, and you keep using increasingly violent language, like hoping to trigger a response. Essentially, the cops did that, but physically, and then they retreated from specific parts, kind of like inviting the, uh, for a inviting kind of like burning um, parts of the city, and then a bunch of opportunists who had no, who often were white, uh, came in, figured, oh, the police is no longer here, let's burn shit. And the civil rights community in the city said, this isn't us. No, seriously, yes, there was one thing that was done by black, by frustrated black people, but everything else was done by opportunists who had no connection to us and often were white, sometimes were literally right-wing provocateurs, and later this turned out to be correct. Um, so, oh, goading, yeah, provoking, yeah, thanks. Um, you're right. So there was a lot of this, so essentially John Griffin's theory this is kind of the civil rights theory. I would say that the cops were doing that systematically in all of America in the 1960s. Um, and the places that avoided riots often were ones with better community policing. New York City, by the way, under John Lindsay. I mean, the crime rate rose and was very high. But um, the police brutality rate in the city fell in the 60s and 70s to much below the U.S. white rate. And um, the city managed to avoid a riot, which pissed off the cops. I mean, what John Lindsay did was, he, for example, said that in Harlem... All, um, he's not letting white cops police Harlem. It's going to be only black cops, which the cops complained was reverse racism or something. And um, and and so this is so I think these are the correct theories of why crime rate was rising in America in the 1960s. There's also, by the way, the lead um, theory, which I don't think is correct. Like it, it it's very touristy, but I don't think it's correct. So then there now. So now there are the right wing theories. The standard right wing theory is welfare. Uh, is welfare corrode society or something? And this was re relatively connected with um, Moynihan. Moynihan specifically came up with the idea that uh, um, welfare policies uh, remove the uh, ability of remove the kind of normal to him patriarchal arrangement, and that the father earns money and brings home uh, the bacon for for the mother and the children. So this is where you start talking about the decline of the black family without talking about, for example, the loss of jobs that black men could earn that were more than minimum wage. And uh, and, and again, he was a sociologist in the 1960s, only then, after he said things that were truthy and that kind of formed modern American racism, did he turn it into a political career. Uh, and so his uh, theory, is, it's kind of very paternalistic also in that uh, it's also related to the idea that this kind of racist scourging, the uh, benign neglect, for example, under so the theory was that uh, the police should just not answer calls in black neighborhoods, or fire department should not answer calls in black neighborhoods, leading to mass arson in the 1970s. That's, the benign neglect issue is literally an expression, like benign neglect is literally the expression that Moynihan gives. Um, and so the idea, this is kind of complex arrangement of both neglect and paternalism, the idea that the racism is actually good for black people, like 
Old South Southern racists didn't think that slavery was, I mean, they thought that black people were simpletons whose natural state was slavery, but usually they would talk about things like black on white crime. So, for example, um, birth of a nation. So the, uh, so, so the kind of scripture of the second clan, uh, the birth of um, early um, 20th century American racism, that was, um, uh, that was a film that was portraying black people raping white women. This was not Moynihan's type of racism. The, the Moynihan type of racism is stuff like black on black crime. Like the belief that there's that um, racist policy that was con- that would constantly scourge uh, black culture and demand that it uh, abnegate every single one of its features. Uh, anything that made some white person even vaguely uncomfortable, like for example, black hair. In, in, so in France, um, there's a national crusade against the hijab. In the United States, the, nobody cares about hijabs. But um, black children who do not straighten their hair at school are sometimes sent back. Or black children who show up to school with, um, wearing red, wearing a red shirt. Like uh, you, you know, like you, my wardrobe from when I am re- recording these uh, these videos. So right now I'm wearing black, but one of the shirts I like wearing is a dark red one. That is often, like, black children, they're sometimes sent home if they wear that because red is supposed to be a gang color of the bloods. Um, so, so that kind of um, th- that kind of constant nitpicking, kind of, kind of constant reminder of one's inferiority, in Moynihan is supposed to be for their own sake. I mean, obviously, it doesn't, obviously he doesn't care. But, um, but it's kind of paternalism that he plays a huge role in. And yeah, his name should not be on anything. And as I think, and as I said, I also don't think Moynihan Station is good infrastructure. So, uh, kill two birds, uh, so kill two birds with one stone. And by one stone, I mean one wrecking ball. Like seriously, this is like they need to do this. And again, there might be a, um, there might be a preservation issue, but uh, it's not the best infrastructure inside. From the inside, uh, there are no seats in there because of hostile architecture. Um, and so this might need like need to get wrecked again, along with Moynihan's name. Nothing should be named after Moynihan. Name something after Moynihan. Name it toxic waste dump after him, and then if you clean it up, then change the name to something to, to something better. Um, at any rate, so wreck. So put the so take this to a wrecking wall. And here's the advantage: when you take this to a wrecking wall, you see all these columns. The point of the columns. The point of the columns is to support stuff above. Um, for example, skyscraper, Madison Square Garden. Um, now, this could be another skyscraper. I'm pretty sure that, like, if you ask random development people, like Revenue or something, what to do with, with Madison Square Garden, they would say, "Oh, make it another skyscraper. I will be very happy to um, build it for ten thousand dollars per square meter, um, plus fees." In, in case, by the way, the number doesn't mean anything to you. Uh, the, uh, I don't want to say this building. Um, I'm, trying to find, I'm trying to remember where the um, yeah, AT&T building is. I think it's on 6th, 42nd. One of the, this building um, from the 2000s was built for about 6,000, 6,000. So 10,000 is a big premium. Um, and Hudson Yards and, Walters, and the New World Trade were both like 12, 13. Um, I want to say in France and Germany it's about three, but also France and Germany don't build super tall, so it's things are 200 meters, not 300. Um, at any rate, so wrecking wall to the, so this I think we all understand can go. This lease is about to run out. This looks pretty from the outside, but not actually usable for accessibility reasons. Not needed for form follows function reasons because you do not because mail does not come through pen section anymore. Uh, named after a terrible person. Uh, so, wrecking ball, wrecking ball. Probably this needs to be done with explosives. Um, and so you have this giant box that doesn't that should not be supporting anything above it. And this is very good because when it, there's nothing above, you can mod this as much as you like. Now, I wrote a rather trolley blog post, and then realizing. It, Actually, this is a not a terrible idea, which is called eliminate Penn Station. Um, now, unfortunately, now I did in fact um, make a presentation uh, about this with uh, the 
would make best impression of a map uh, with, with like a diagram. Uh, but this was more like how I'm complaining that my computer is about to push six years old and about to go to school. Um, this is something that I made. Uh, so th this computer I got mid-2016. I started using it in mid-2017. The uh, map, the, the graphic is from early 2017 from the old com from the, an even older computer. So I don't have it on. So I'm going to need to reconstruct this. So now... Um, this is so as I said, it's about center of center line of street to center line of street, 33rd to 31st, um, with the understanding that like safety things go a little bit farther. So what is it? So center line of 33rd, center line of 31st would be about 150. So this is about 155, maybe. I don't think it's 150. I think it's actually straight 150. So 150 meters of width. Um, so let's try to figure out together. Um, what can we do with 150 meters of width? And we already know what it's like when you have 22 tracks and 11 platforms. Remember, they're not 22 tracks, they're 21 tracks, but um, platform 10 is uh, much wider and uh, almost to the point that there should be an extra track here because track 18 uh, is between platforms 9 and 10. Track, so tracks 21, 20, uh, 19, and there kind of be, should be a track here. So there, be some, there should be something like 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. But what kind of should be track 19 is just wider platform space. Uh, I do not know the history of why it is so. Um, if anyone here knows, please let me know. I'm curious. But this is something that I might need to just email Shoal or Uday because they're way more historically uh, interested in. Uh, I shouldn't say historically interested, but much more historically literate in, in these kind of things in these kinds of things than I am. So now um, what do we do in about 150 meters? So this is what you do when you have 22 tracks, give or take. Again, it's, I mean the, the platforms are not exactly the same width. You can kind of see that platform uh, four, no platform five is wider than platform four. Uh, but the widths are not that different until you had to uh, until you get to the wide platform. So the one white platform, platform time. And so the um so we can again figure this out from blueprints um and from standards. So it goes like this. Uh in American regulations, um the distance between the edge of a platform and the center of a train is or the center of a track rather is five foot seven. Uh now this kind of conflicts with accessibility laws actually, because what is five seven times two? Uh, 5, 7 times 2 is uh, 11, 2. Uh, now, what is the width of a train in American regulation? So, so, uh, so it's kind of a box, let's say, between two platforms would be 11, 2. It is, uh, in theory, it can go up to 10, 8, but in practice, it's 10, 6, usually even 10, 4. Now, Americans with Disability Act specifies that new build if it's a new, if it's an entirely new build thing, the maximum allowed gap between the train and the platform is three inches. So unless you use the entire 10-8, uh, which again you are legally allowed to, but in practice the standard is more like 10-6, uh, you don't actually do that, right? Because 11-2 and it's on both sides, so subtract it twice. Um, you need um, subtract three inches twice, you get 10-8, and to get 10-6 you need to subtract four inches, which already requires a grandfather clause. Um, and if it's a 10-4, then it's 5 inches, and that, in theory, should not even be allowed, even with grandfathering. Essentially, federal, that regulation conflicts with disability accessibility regulations, and thankfully with uh, uh, gap fillers on, mounted on the train, uh, like in Zurich, uh, like in, I think, I, I think I saw them in Leipzig, in Karlsruhe. Um, they exist on Brightline in the United States gap fillers, and they might be mandated nationwide. Uh, now, that makes this enti an entirely moot point because gap fillers, I think they're good up to about a foot, so four inches of cars. Um, yay technology. Um, but again, and, but, but anyway, the regulation says 5.7. Now, uh, the regulations may be written in furlongs, but we do not use furlongs, so this is meter 70. Because a meter, a meter 70 uh, and 2 millimeters, if you care, which you shouldn't. Uh, so, um, 
as I said, the correct way to do things, and I don't know if I have a good, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to check if I have Shootgrip 21 blueprint, or anything that looks vaguely like a Shootgrip 21 blueprint. No, because they're only, oh, there. Principal track layout. So this is schematic, but it's good enough for what I need, right? So four approach tracks on each side. They turn into, each, so each approach track vaguely becomes two platform tracks. So um, I believe the main tracks are Feuerbach. I want to say it's Feuerbach to Feldertunnel are the main, is the main thing. So there's going to be just a lot less traffic. But like I think the interstate is all going to do this. And then uh, these tunnels are for regional traffic to not very important places for the most part. Um, so you can kind of see, I mean, in theory, they want the Feuerbach field uh, tunnel connection to just use this track. It's kind of the easiest way to do it without any kind of conflict and without taking diverging turnouts. But you can actually do also flip uh, and then, I guess, return to the track here. Uh, and then rip, rip. Now with other things that are again mostly for uh, for the use of regional tracks, it's going to be something like rip, and then one of these. Um, again, it's more complex than it should be, and it's kind of weird that the uh, approach tracks that are kind of easier to get to more station tracks um, are actually the ones that expect to see less traffic. Um, but first of all, Sugar Run has never been a particularly great project. But second, um, I'm sure, that, I mean, you can do it this way, it's fine. And, the, and these are good turnouts. I think the entire thing is going to be, I want to say, 80 kilometers an hour approach speed, uh, um, which is very good for like a constrained urban tunnel because it's entirely green field. Um, at any rate, so you do the same trick with Man Station. So as I said, six approach tracks because we're planning around this crayon. Most of, it, of this crayon is already kind of official. The red line is really in existence. Green from this direction is gateway. Orange from this direction pre-exists. This is something they should be doing and it's not difficult. This is something they're already planning on, not doing, but on future proofing. Maybe not to Grand Central, maybe the inferior alternative, alt -S, but at the level of what's to be done with Penn Station, Alt-G for this one, and Alt-S, that is to say, doing this, they're the same. Um, so six approach tracks, and we need two platform tracks flanking the same platform for every approach track. So Sugar 21 has four approach tracks on each side, turning into eight platform tracks. Penn Station needs 12. So what does this mean? So again, we have about 150, um, and we can just assume a kind of symmetry. So essentially, we're going to divide the station into six parts. Each part is an approach track. The approach track will then split into. Let me let me actually be in front of the camera so that they know what you can see. So an approach track is this, two fingers, let's say it's two rails, and then it splits into two tracks that flank the same platform, and then they merge back on the other side. Um, and this repeats six times because there are six approach tracks. Uh, on each side, it's three inbound, three outbound. Uh, and so we divide this by six uh, and try to figure out what kind of platform width we can deal with. And so, um, as I said, 1.7 is platform to center line of track, and there are two tracks, so this is 3.4. Now, center line of track, then needs to go to the center line of the next track over. Um, and now what is that? Um, so this is called track centers. So when you say track centers, it means the spacing between track centers on adjacent tracks. Um, the United States is kind of weird in that people pretend they need very large, very, very wide track centers, but they actually have unusually narrow track centers. Most of the Northeast corridor is, I think, four, 13 feet, so four meters. Um, I think there's only 12 feet on the New Haven line, which is why the tilting there is kind of wonky, but which, I mean... Until recently, they were not allowed to tilt. Today, they're allowed to tilt, but they can't r make, but they can't run faster with the tilt. Uh, the, that's not because the track centers are narrow. The lack of speed boost is just because that's just bad Metro North. That's just bad Metro North timetabling. 
And so what you need is, first of all, this kind of permanent pairing, which means that uh, we're going to have 12 tracks, right? We get six approach tracks. Um, so I'm just going to use this map as a basis for the crayon. Um, so track one, two, three, four, because they're the, because each color is two tracks. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Um, and pairs of tracks always match at the same platform. So if the platform needs to change, if the track needs to change, you're already on the same platform. This means if I'm on, on this green line, which is called line two, um, make around. Uh, let's say I'm on a, I, I prefer to get on. And prepare to get on Penn Station to go north, so to Grand Central, and from there to somewhere in the New Haven line. Um, uh, so I'm going in this direction. Trains drive on the right in the United States, so it's going to be the to the right of the track, so south. So it's going to be tracks one or two permanently. So I buy a ticket. I mean, maybe it's going to be. I mean, I, mean, I guess it's just going to be commuter rail. So kind of weird to call it ticket, but I buy a ticket. From let's say here to New Haven, if track number will be printed, it's going to be one or two. It may need to do a last minute change, but for the most part, it's going to be consistent because you should have an alternation. Transit track one, transit track two, transit track one, transit track two. Um, it's going to be in the schedule. It's always going to be here. You're not going to be flexible. The train again might move to the other track, the one or two, but it's never going to be on track three or four, track three or four is going in the opposite direction. It's never going to be tracks five or six, five or six are the red line. Um, now, yeah, maybe I'm at Penn Station and I'm taking, a, and, I'm, and let's say the red line is where Amtrak should go. So um, if I'm taking a train to Boston from New York, yeah, it's going to be track five or six. And it's never going to move to any other track. The infrastructure does not need to be set up this way. It's fine. Flexibility is severely overrated in American planning. What you need is reliability. And how do you build a reliable system? You look for sources of delays and search and destroy them. So, for example, um, an example. Uh, so, for example, a lot of the delays come from uh, uh, station stops being longer than necessary because the platforms are low. And one passenger in a wheelchair wrecks their entire timetable. So raise the platforms. Much of the Northeast Carter, I mean, all the, so on the Northeast Carter, I think all of the, all of the train stations, except on the Providence line, are high platform. Maybe in Philadelphia, they're not, but certainly in the New York area, they're all high platform. So, uh, so you do that, and you have these gap fillers. So here's what happens when there's no person in a wheelchair. The gap filler deploys, you, everyone walks into the train. Here's what happens when there's a person in a wheelchair. The gap filler, the train gets to the station, the gap filler deploys, and the person in the wheelchair rolls themselves onto the train. No conductor, no nothing. Uh, and this delays the train by zero seconds because wheelchairs are a nifty invention that is actually mobile, and they don't take forever to run on surfaces that are graded to be smooth and wheelchair accessible. Um, this is what you should be doing. And likewise, if there are more people at the station than expected, well, they're just getting on and off. There's going to be white doors at good locations, so maybe two, at the minimum, you want two per car. These are large enough cars, you might even want to do three. And the two should be at the quarter points, and white. Um, the LRR, by the way, in Metro North, already do that. New Jersey Transit is the big offender. Um, and uh, there should also be single-level trains. Yeah, it means fewer seats, but also people get on and off faster. Uh, and this is very important. This is why Tokyo, by the way, has very few bi-levels. Um, mostly on the, I think, mostly, I think only on uh, green cars, so first class. It's because it's so important for them to have fast access and egress that they're willing to sacrifice on train capacity. Um, and so this, so people get on and off very fast. So you have predictable station dwells. If you're wrong, you're wrong by 10 seconds, not by three minutes. And the, and you're going to have enough schedule padding that you can make the 10 seconds by the next stop. That's not a big deal. Uh, and so, the, so this means that the trains would just be on time. And you're not going to do these weird scheduling, these weirdly creative schedules that make every... System, every part of the system connect to every other part. So uh, if a train on the L on one LRR branch is uh, delayed, then the delays cascade to the rest of the system. No, if the delay is local to a line. Um, Switzerland works this way, Japan works this way. Um, maybe not with the total separation I'm envisioning in Switzerland because it 
I mean, the entire population of Switzerland is about the same as that of New York City. But the but they similarly have a bunch of mechanisms to prevent delays from cascading. They don't think the delays are never happening. Delays happen all the time. It's just that the three minute delay is on your train and it doesn't disturb the rest of the system. And so, whereas in a place like the United States, three minute delay on the Northeast Corridor makes everything else delayed, and that's nothing to do with the fact that they don't have enough tracks um, across the Hudson. They're planning on keeping that even after. So again, reliability center design lets you have consistent stations with cons- or consistent platform assignments. So it's much more pleasant for passengers. If I'm a passenger, I see track two. Okay, go down to track two. Um, and so, the, and this, this is much more important than anything else, to be honest. Much more important than the grant we're doing right now. So once you do that, okay, remember, we have 150 meters, kind of six parts to the station. They should not have, maybe we can have emergency connections, we can never use them in regular service ever. Um, so 25 meters minus the um, distance from track center to edge of platform, 21.6. Now, track centers, um, you should not do just four meters. Four meters is... Making the trains run on time does not involve shooting anyone. What are you talking about? Like, do you know how delayed the trains were in fascist Italy and Nazi Germany? Like, this is actually something that I keep harangue about because everyone thinks that the Holocaust trains ran very efficiently, and they really didn't. One of the things that happened with the Holocaust is that um, the Jews were not important. So a train could have different kinds of cargo, right? Um, could be munitions um, for one of the fronts. It could be uniforms for the soldiers. It could be a troop transport for carrying Wehrmacht troops to a front. Or it could be a cargo like Jews to the concentration camp. Um, and, the Jew, and, 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 the, and the Jewish cargo was the least important, so the trains had the, la- had the lowest priority in the system. Uh, they were delayed by hours, sometimes days. Um, in at least one case, I think many cases, um, the train was so delayed and there were no provisions on the train, and the train was very cramped that by the time that it reached the extermination camp, all of the Jews on the train had already died of exposure or um, uh, suffocation or hunger on the train. Uh, you know, it's also a Mussolini reference, and that reference was always apocryphal. It was always people making up. It, it, it was never something that people who lived in fascist Italy said about their train network. It was always something that outsiders or nothing of Italian trains uh, said as kind of thinking that fascism was more efficient, which it never was. Something nobody gets. That uh, the people think about German efficiency or something and uh, think that Hitler was efficient. No, he wasn't. Mussolini did. They had a lot of pomp, but their government was horrific. And I don't just mean morally horrific. Like Hitler would sometimes give different subordinates overlapping fields of responsibility and not even tell them about it, um, hoping that they would compete and have a lot of court politics between them and may the strongest Nazi win because something, something social Darwinism. This is how fascist government actually works. And as it happens right now, there um, exist fascist governments and superpowers in the world. And I do not mean the United States, I mean the other ones. And they kind of do the same thing where everything is based on who can hide information from Xi Jinping better um, so no, the running the, the places that run the trains on time, um, Switzerland. Switzerland has a lot of social problems. Fascist is fascism is not one of them. Japan, same thing. I mean, yeah, Japan used to be a fascist state. The Japan that runs the trains on time, yeah, it's a train with re- weird politics and no real partisan competition. But uh, I can go on the media and say the prime minister is a World War Two revisionist. I don't know the current one is, but the previous one. The Prime Minister is a World War II revisionist asshole, and um, Japan needs to uh, uh, realize that, no, seriously, the country did, uh, in fact, commit Nazi levels of war crimes, and no, there was never any justification. Yeah, people will complain, but nothing will be done to you, okay? This is, like, Japan is a democratic state. Thank you very much. Um, And so, anyway, um, going back to this, so, um, the, so, when, so, if you just have very simple interlockings means you also don't need to have ladder tracks or anything that is similarly complex with the switches, which lets you increase speeds further. Again, I mean, there's a upper limit to what you can do. I mean, the uh, so you, it's, it's like squeezing the last couple seconds or maybe your last or the last half minute or something, but it's not, not terrible. Squeeze another half minute. 
Um, like lots of spending is being done on speed raises that uh, on speed on speed ups on faster parts of the Northgate's card or that save one minute one minute thirty at a time. So um, simplifying the interlocking will do more. I think again, I think it's I think done optimally. It uh, and plus more aerodynamic trains that can go through the tunnels faster. I think this is about five minutes right now, and this is also about five minutes, and this can be done in about two and a half, two. So um, the station inter so it's, it's three minutes on each side. I think the station interlocking is about a minute, a minute and a half, and then a minute and a half to two minutes is the tunnels. Um, the tunnels are the most speculative part, the stations. Again, the station is very constrained. If you remove the stuff from the top and you can move it, and you can rearrange the columns, the impossible will become easy. Um, so again, wrecking ball, wrecking ball, wrecking ball. Um, Twelve tracks, I think. And then uh, what you do is so again, so, so again, so the space is twenty-five meters minus this, minus the three, minus one point seven twice. Then you want track centers that are more than four meters. You can do four meters, but you want more. Um, you might need to do um, support columns for walkways and. Uh, they might be centers of tracks or they might be centers of platforms. It can be either. But I'm going to be very large and I'm going to assume the following thing. The train is about, let's pretend a meter point seven, even though it's not a like meter point six. Um, then there should be a danger zone of one of 0 0.5. That's how German regulations work. And then a safe zone of one. So it's 3.2. But wait, the safe zone is between two tracks. You can use the same safe zone between two tracks. So it's 1.7 plus 0 0.5 plus another 0 0.5 for half the safe zone times 2. So not like 5.5. And then let's round up 3.4 to 3.5. So essentially it gives us another 20 centimeters on the safe zone. Um, and I believe it's this. And you might need another half meter or something that I'm not thinking about. Um, I doubt it's going to be another full meter. So... Everything combined, again, it's 25 minus 3.5, let's say minus 5.5, and it's 16. Again, you might need another meter, so it's 15, maybe 16 meters of platform width. Um, this is what you can do with six, uh, with this kind of 3 by 2 system. Um, and I'm going to try and see if they have track plot pictures of this. Um, so this is the center of the RER. It's where the RER, A, B, and D meet. Um, it's an enormous deck, cost, I think, more than a billion euros in today's money when it was built in the 70s. The connection that it was part of between Nation and Aubert, I think that is an unbroken record for construction costs per kilometer in a rich non-English speaking country. I think Munich with a, I mean a, a, in, in a higher cost country, uh, the second tunnel, so 2020s, 2030s, might actually get near that, but not quite more. Um, so let me see if I can find platform. Okay, this is okay, this is a platform with the RER D, but the, the RER A and B are they really uh, so um this might still be the RERD. I don't think this is. So, um, okay, it's also an old thing. Like the the I think the screens look like an older thing. Um, so the, so I believe the actual platforms are wider than these. I believe that these are the RERD platforms, which are the narrower ones. So you know the um, most manly man in country least manly man other country meme, like, like the most manly is a, is, a, is, a, is a fanboy and the least manly is this guy with like, uh, who's so ripped it's very obvious he's injecting steroids and is going to die in five years of overdose. Um, so this is, so imagine this is the least wide platform at the app. Um, can't find the RER A and B. Yeah, this is RERD. Why do you not have... Okay. Okay. 
Yes, I know that I... Do you think I would have said que if I wanted something that was in English? Okay, yeah, this is on the... Uh, okay, this is an RERA train. Uh, can you tell that... Okay, so the resolution sucks. But can you tell that uh, this is only part of the platform? Part of the platform? Uh, depth. Like, th these are giant platforms, and they're 17 meters, which is overkill. You don't have enough vertical circulation, um, which is a problem. They only have usually one escalator in each direction at the max. They need more. But they're so, so wide. Okay, this is RRA, you see? This is not the entire platform. This is not the full platform. This is how uh, wide these are. So lots and lots and lots of space. Um, I want to say it's unobstructed, but no, it actually is. You can kind of see um, lots of columns in between, but I mean, support columns for this, but it's um, lots of seating also. On the platform, the platform is the waiting area. You're not expected to wait in a concourse and then only go to the platform when the train is arriving. You go to the platform. It's like on the subway. Now, and one of the problems in New York City specifically is the commuter rail system. It's not out of commuter rail. They think that like the subway um, means black, uh, means young black men are going to rape their daughters. There, this is like, and, and it's this visceral. There's this kind of visceral suburban race racist hate of the city and all it stands for. Um, and kind of idea that the suburbs are better and even some racial minorities um, are kind of assimilating to that. Um, and so we tell people it's like the subway and it's like me telling you, oh yeah, sure, let's do government like North Korea. Th this is literally how New Yorkers take it. It's not in how suburban New Yorkers take it. It's not even a floating, like you would say, like China, it kind of evokes the same kind of myth of fascist efficiency, um, and quite a lot of people with mood affiliation with dictators like China and like how they have obsequious workers um, who don't unionize uh, and don't talk back to managers or something, or if they don't if they talk back, it's not as if the Americans who talk about it would notice. Um, it's not even, no, it's like an entirely negative gag reflex, and this is the problem. So the way it should be doing, it should be done is no concourse. So this is what I call eliminate train station, hole in the ground. You don't do a concourse. You wait on the platform. When you're not on the platform, you're on the street. Maybe you go up to, um, maybe maybe you go to the subway here or here. Um, or you go to any of these places and any of these spaces that have seating. I mean, if these are restaurants at this point, they will have outdoor seating. Use that. Um, so you're going to have this giant hole. Um, two blocks wide, 150 by, I think this is about 240-ish. With, uh, I guess where the width of the avenue is going to be more like 270, maybe. Um, the avenues go through. Um, and so the, uh, so you have avenue, avenue. Probably want two walkways in the middle, trisecting. Um, so you're going to have access point, access point, access point, access point, access point, access point, so six access point, maybe... A little bit here also for the wider platforms, but that's weird. Um, and remember, it's 16 meters. This is enormous. Um, what can we do with this? So I can tell you that an escalator, so let's talk about escalators for a moment. And uh, let me see if I can find the references because the vendors keep changing them. So Otis Escalator uh, Catalog. Uh, and then we're going to do Kona. Uh, and, uh, oh, and there's technical brochure is good. Uh, and then we're going to do Tucson Group. Um, and this is just because sometimes they don't tell me everything that I need. So let's, uh, no, I don't need this twice. So let's see. This is Opus. Uh, oh, and they're telling me it's a European production, um, just to make sure that it's uh, a uh, European production, and it's in uh, Brezva. Brez I'm sorry, Pony, if you're watching this. I'm sorry that I'm mangling your language. Now, please do what the chat, what the, what the, what the poll did, and just make it zh like anyone else. 
Um, so Bratislav uh, is okay, European production, whatever, I don't care about where you're in. Okay, so step width. Um, escalate, there are three standards, which are 600, 800, and 1,000 millimeters. Um, the pit width is 600 millimeters longer, so the big escalators, the ones that are used for public transport, um, the pit width, so the footprint, that side to side is 1.6 meters. Um, I'm going to see if I can find the exact reference to this in one of these, but it's the pit is 1.6 meters. Um, it's called pit width, if you can. Uh, outdoor packages, no, I don't care, I just... Yeah, so oh, not quite 1600, so they say it's 1550. Um, okay. Uh, it is 30 degrees. I believe the Americans are. It's 30 degrees. The Europeans 35. Not terribly important. Return to doing. Um, you have two steps, so 800 millimeters on each side. Then it's about 12 meters depth, I believe, between platform and street level. So 30 degrees is going to be the coastline of. Uh, not cosine, cotangent, because um, I need, because if it's 12 vertical, how much horizontal is this? The answer is 20, 21, uh, 800 millimeters on each side. So I need 23-ish meters of horizontal width uh, by a meter point six. Now remember, uh, we have a meter point six. Uh, so in theory, we have space for 10 of these because 16 meters, maybe nine if it's only 15, but I mean, then we need some space to walk around or maybe walk between if it's going to be two banks. Uh, and um, so the way it works is uh, the, so, so again, so they're saying it's even a little bit less than um, 60 meters extra. Normally, again, I think it's 60 meters extra. Uh, inclination, step width, speed. Um, they're not only worth the capacity. If the capacity is um, for for the longest, for the widest elevator, sorry, widest escalator is between six thousand and nine thousand passengers per hour. Uh, no, I don't care about your um, travelators. I'm looking at at the uh, escalators. Where's this? This is how Hauptbahnhof. I may have used this exact escalator. I've used many escalators at Hauptbahnhof. Yeah, they're functional. Thank you very much. What is people flow? Not what I want to know. Okay, so they're saying that uh, full load is thick is six thousand um, on the uh, uh, on the wider. I think again. I think it's, I think I think it's in. I've seen I've seen things go up to nine k, but I believe it's but so six k is within the range. Uh, okay, uh, this is Washington, D.C., right? Yeah, this looks like Washington, D.C. Uh, blue line, green line, yellow line, red line, silver, yeah. Uh, small retail, large shopping malls, they're also the same as public transport. Uh, Uh, oh, I guess airports also want there to be a travelator because airports expect you to walk a kilometer within a terminal. Uh, and they're saying many things, but not what the pitch would be. Um, but also, and also various uh, arrangements of multiple escalators are not, are not needed. You can just do a single escalator again. No intermediate steps. This is really important. It's going to be really important because um, when you don't do intermediate steps, I mean, again, it's just much less, much less friction getting between the street and the station. The point of a station is to be interface between the street, between the city, really, and the train. Don't make the interface take longer. Don't do signatures. The two walkways I mentioned that are, need, that are going to be needed for, again, six escalator banks. Flip, 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 flip. Um, these um, are going to be, I mean, you can make the bridges like nice arches or something and then uh, make sure there are columns 
probably at the platforms. Um, it's going to be space between the escalators. You don't need to do this on the. Uh, you don't need to do this on the what's called on the upper track level. They like you don't need to do it at the tracks. I mean, the um, platforms are kind of the track level. I mean, a meter twenty something higher, but okay, you're still not telling me the pit width. Um, and I do not care where the auto works. Step width, step width. Where's the pit width? Uh, inclination, inclination. Vertical rise, yeah, you can know that they can go up to 12 meters uh, and public transportation escalators, they can go even more. Um, there are very long escalators, even cause motion sickness in some people, and it's some very deep stations, like uh, the DC Metro uh, has some. And uh, only transition radii, but what they're not telling me is the pit width, which, I mean, I know the pit width, I know what, the, I know what Otis said the pit width is, you're not telling me the pit width, and I'm very, okay, almost passenger circulation area for parallel escalators, you're still not telling me your fucking pit width, um, head guards, okay, so this was not as useful, Escalator dimensions, something options and planning dimensions, maybe. Uh. Okay, um, I'm also suffering from the fact that you're not showing. Okay. Why is it, why are they trying to make everything look like it's a reaction force? Okay, now they're saying the pit width is 1780, I guess. Um, so, a thousand millimeters step width. Oh, and here they're saying 16,000. Yeah, oh, not 16,000, 1600. Yeah, that's what I thought. Elevator. Oh, the commercial escalator. Um, and now you're telling me a lot of things, but not what I need. Uh, service design tools. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm also not a buyer, so and I mean, I'm not the. Uh, so, so I'm not the uh, target audience for these. They're trying to get people to buy theirs. Whereas I don't care, I just want to know how much space I need. Okay, you're not telling me. Okay. Escalators and moving walkways. Table of content, escalators, moving walks. I'm on. Step width. Okay, it goes up to this. You think the rise only goes up to 10 meters, but yeah, it can go more. Um, be confident in your next step. Transit duty. Dimensional data, pit width, again. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to look at more. I mean, it's, I mean, again, as I said, it's 1.6 meters per escalator. Um, so 1.6 meters per escalator times, um, you, I think you can get away with six, right? Because 1.6 times six is 9.6. Um, stairs are maybe two meters, if not, in between. Okay, I have 16 meters of platform, I have 2 meters, that, that, I mean with this, it's 2-ish meters on the side of each of the platform, on uh, the, side, the side of, not even platform, on the side of each elevator, uh, not elevator, escalator and platform, that's a lot of space. Um, and so, yeah, so it's 6 escalators, you can run escalators 4 up to a down at rush hour, um, so you're having 4 up escalators, sadly. You have six escalator banks for platform, right? Because we're talking about these the two streets that are ends and then two intermediate, like the trisecting walkways. And so that's six access points. 
and 6,000 power. So this is, so you have escalators that let you evacuate a platform at this rate, 14, 144,000 an hour per escalator. No, no, per escalator, per, per platform. Now, I don't want to do this per hour, but I want to do it for two minutes because two minutes is the uh, interval, is the minimum interval between two trains. Yeah, um, and remember, all the trains at a platform make the same stop, um, are going in the same direction, they're, they're the same approach track, so it's not going to be a mix of two trains. So yeah, uh, if the train has, like, unloads more people this, you're going to have problems, but you can see how much, how, how massive capacity, how much the capacity is massive to the point you can even have fewer escalators. If it's, let's say, three up escalators rather than four, it's three by six, 6,000 an hour. Okay, that's still, I mean, you cannot fit as many people on one train. I think in Japan, a train of this, of like 10, car, 10 Japanese cars, eight American, would have the very worst, a little less than 3,000. Um, and that's only in very specific things in Tokyo, not most of Tokyo, and they're never going to unload at one station. So, yeah, I mean, that's a solved problem. Um, you can, uh, you, it's it's so solved, it's not even good. I mean, yeah, even with more people wanting 7th Avenue than 8th Avenue, even with um, even with a few stragglers, even with, uh, even with the fact that you need some spare capacity to avoid cascading queues, that's fine. You're going to, it's going to clear very fast. Which means maybe we don't even need 15 or 16 meters of platform, which is fine. The up escalator is what counts. So this is, so as I said, um, kind of like the defo my default round station is this. However, from time to time, I'm getting pangs about doing something different. Now, different does not mean this block gets knocked down. This is a non-starter. Okay, this is a complete bullshit project. It should not happen. If you want to knock down this block, the only reason you're going to do it is if you're zoning this for skyscrapers on Firma. Because, yes, this is adjacent to Penn Station. Obviously, this is a great place for commercial towers. But it doesn't have to be right here. I mean, yeah, I can upzone this and let people demolish, but also this. Right? I mean, it's almost as adjacent to Penn Station. Or this. Or this. Um, but the, here it's going to see maybe more buildings. I think this is slightly, it's just kind of a slightly lower block than this. But yeah, I mean, so and maybe if you're up on a lot of these things, you don't need to um, demolish the entire block. Maybe you can demolish one thing. Maybe you can like demolish a church or something or this building, and then make this very big, or demolish this building. Which is, it's a parking structure. This looks like a parking garage. Um, or you demolish a parking garage, which is not the thing that should exist in Manhattan next to Penn Station, and turn this into a beautiful super tall. Um, and then maybe one of these, like this valley, can turn into something into something big. Or if one of these buildings uh, isn't generating enough revenue or something, so so we can have like kind of more organic skyscraper district where not everything has to look identical. Because yeah, sometimes I, I mean this is not a, a top-down thing. It's, I mean maybe zoning is, but the development isn't. Actually, I mean if you think about it, a lot of what people complain about about Soviet housing. Okay, I mean you had these. Micro districts, right? The, the um, so, uh, you had these micro districts with these housing projects, and yeah, the housing projects had some housing quality problems. Um, I think they used Cinder, so the uh, let's not do Moscow. Let's do one of these random cities that they keep not being able to distinguish from any other Russian city um, on uh, on GeoGuessr. Uh, let's try to find an Yekaterinburg or yeah, Yekaterinburg. Maybe. Or Tilyabinsk, or one of these. Um, and uh, you can kind of see how like the how repetitive this is. Like it's all of these uh, long housing projects with a bunch of uh, elevators. Like it, like like you can kind of see here maybe that it's kind of to a um, adjacent building. So uh, with uh, staircase, staircase. Um, and uh, and again, it's very repetitive, and you can kind of see it from the sky, from from satellite view. I'm mean, gonna say this is a different printer. Again, I'm just doing this because I've seen these enough on GeoGuessr that I don't and I don't want to do something like Moscow, which would have had a lot of much of an urban core. Um, and again, you can kind of see how these 
are reused design and don't just design reused interior design or anything but I'm sure that exists too it's more like the urbanism is very repetitive in these micro districts um now this is residential but commercially you can run into the same thing where you have these skyscraper districts that are very monotonous very monotonous you don't need that you yeah um you do a development plan and then you build a few skyscrapers and then yeah in 10 years you do a different development plan maybe you start to change and then you put them slightly different and then it's a kind of mosaic of different things different styles in between them you might think find things that just never were rebuilt and that's fine like i, I mean you're not trying to have an entire city built at exactly the same colonial city in my backyard that city you're looking forward to Montenegro and Ukrainian NATO troops storming them? You mean the micro districts of Yekaterinburg? I mean... Aw. Uh, but yeah, no. Why, also, why Montenegrins? I, I don't get it. I mean, Montenegro... Um, I don't want to judge, but Montenegro is not the most powerful army in NATO. I mean... But anyway, no, the Ukrainian NATO troops would be nice, but don't invade the Katerinburg of all places. Um, but anyway, so um, the, so the situation in New York, again, if, if you're doing three lines, then do that. But the thing is, I keep getting these pains about maybe doing four lines. Again, within the same rough footprint, the one thing that I will allow uh, the one thing I will concede is that you might need to expand incrementally under the street a little bit. So if you're doing instead of center to center, let's say you're doing southern end of, let's say without the sidewalk, 31st to northern end, again, without the sidewalk of 33rd. So this is, wait, oh, right, because it's 34th and 33rd, that explains quite a lot. Okay, this is 166-ish. I might do 168 instead of 160 just for the divisibility by 8, but that might be a, a little bit too greedy. So if it's 160, again, with a little bit of expansion, and remember, the actual footprint is not 150, it's 155 with like a little bit of expansion. Um, and on the side, um, for, my, for, for I don't even know what mechanical is that. So if it's 160, and again, it's eight platforms. So um, so let's just for a sec look at the, so remember we did before 150 way six, and it's 25. And then we talked about 16 meter platforms. And if it's 160 by eight, then it's 20. So five fewer meters, so it's 11 meter platforms. Now 11 meters don't let you do, the, oh my God, uh, how much space um, are you using kind of thing, where it's uh, six escalators. No, you can do six escalators at the very end, but only at the very end of the platform, right? Because then you have 70 centimeters of worker walkway, and even that may be not enough. Um, so you might even only have five escalators, three and two. Uh, and um, then most places will have four, and I don't think that's enough for a uh, 11 minus 16, 6.4. I'm uncomfortable with making it much of a staircase. I mean, you might need have like a meter and a half, and that's a meter and a half on each side. Again, I'm uncomfortable, but you might do a max of, let's say, only escalators, or at some places you'll have uh, escalator, two escalators and stairs. Um, you're going to have three up escalators. Um, you might have, again, it's going to be a, uh, maybe two, even, maybe even only two in some places, but the point is that you will still have enough. Because again, six access points, three up escalators, 18. Um, Right now, there are, I believe, eight access points or seven access points, the worst, which is either an up escalator uh, or a uh, staircase. And here, I'm not even looking at the staircases, I'm just looking at the up escalators. And this is, again, that's about 100,000 per hour, um, 3.6k per train. And these are single rock. And like the, the only way, and remember, this is going in one direction, but if it, if it exchanges, so, so, if, so the thing is, if you are exchanging passengers, like getting a lot of ons and not just offs in the morning rush, then you also need to down escalators. But it's midtown Manhattan, you're not going to have that many ons, I'm sorry. Like, I mean, yeah, there are people who are first coming in, but let's not compare the number of people who will ever live here with the number of people who are working here now, okay? There's something like um, a million 
workers in Midtown broadly construed, there are not a million people living in Midtown. And honestly, the people living in Midtown, something like half of them work in Midtown because Midtown is very expensive. So why would you live in Midtown? It's not a very desirable, it's not considered a very desirable neighborhood. Um, the neighborhood that people just think of, oh, it's such a chic place to live, I don't know, village or something with the Upper West Side. But Midtown, you live there for the commute. So yeah, um, let me actually uh, show you this uh, document. Uh, actually, the, uh, okay, I'm going to do open office calc and not this, just because it's going to be easier for me to find the uh, it's called What Neighborhoods from a uh, blog post I wrote called What City of Neighborhoods. This is Community Board Community Board of New York and how many residents they have who are employed, how many work in the borough. In Manhattan, most work in Manhattan because, again, you probably, if you're paying Manhattan rent, you're probably trying to do so to not have a bum commute. And um, how many work in the same community board? And yeah, um, CB5, which is Midtown, so it's defined as 14th to 59th, 3rd to 6th, or 3rd to, uh, or Lex to 8th, depending on which part. And yeah, it's nearly half. Uh, yeah, because, so, these are not people who are going to fill trains to the suburbs. Why would they? Suburbs are cheaper. You, you, you work in Jersey, you're probably going to live in Jersey. I mean, yeah, I mean, Jersey's kind of sucks to live in, but not if you, if that gets you a better commute than from the city. So, yeah, it's okay to be someone, um, someone asymmetric. Now, remember, you do need to build these. You do need to realign the tunnel. This is, again, three uh, lines, four lines. Again, there's space for that. So how it's four lines even going to look, right? The, the main thing is if you have four lines, um, yeah, there's going to be space, right? As I said, I mean, it's tunnels. It, it's not all. It's platforms. There are uh, going to be something like 10 or 11 meters. The current ones we may remember is six, right? So it's, 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 today's about 150. Divide not by eight, but by 11. And it's not quite subtract nine. Remember, 150, we're subtracting uh, about 10 or nine. Uh, and uh, and I think that the track centers might even be slightly too tight, but then there are the, top, the columns between them, so it might wash out. So the actual today, without the very wide tunnel, it's the, what do you click on? It's maybe this, so maybe five points, four points, maybe five meters-ish. Um, so five meters as opposed to, and, and this is gonna, and it's gonna dig into the five meters, something like 10, 11 meters rather, which is a lot wider. And, and it's, again, even five meters, is more or less sufficient for current capacity. So with 11, with the concourses replaced with just maybe fewer walkways, but large banks of escalators, and uh, and, and there's and of course there's going to be elevators in the uh, the walkways so that um, people in wheelchairs can get on, uh, and, uh, and and stair and and again some staircases. Um, that's going to be more than enough. Um, again, it feels a little bit more cramped. Um, whereas 16 meters is wide enough for whatever the hell you want. One thing with the four, with the eight track, sort of the eight platform 16 track solution is, um, so here's something that bothers me, which is what are tracks going to use to get out of that state, right? So it's essentially a thing that you only ever use if instead of line one, line two, line three, is in my crown. But by the way, in case you don't know how my crown looks, uh, and, and the numbers here are weird. Um, one is red, two is green, three is orange, and this is historical, one exists, two is gateway, three is realigning the northern tunnels, which absolutely exists, to the Empire Connection, which exists with the North Korea Rail, with, again, it requires a little bit of tunneling to get it to be, to connect like this, but it's not a lot of tunneling. And uh, it's line three, and then line four is the blue line, which goes north-south, so from Grand Central North, it is the existing tunnel from Grand Central to uh, Staten Island is the crayon part, um, and then five is from Atlantic from Atlant from Flatbush Avenue to the east. This is just the Atlantic branch, and the uh, Babylon branch of the LIR. These all exist, and then the this doesn't exist. 
this DC was saying it doesn't have trains but has the right of way. The, the trains that should go here instead of go here. And then so line five um, is kind of the lower Manhattan thing, and then line six is I think an extra thing to just uh, create more capacity at this point in the system. In case you don't know what the number, what these numbers mean, I use them consistently on my blog. But I mean each rail fan has three different crayons, so. Um, so anyway, the uh, so essentially the way you're doing four line, um, eight approach tracks rather than six is if it's these, but also separate high speed rail tracks or, or intercity rail tracks, and you're doing that if you expect so much high speed rail. So up to about six trains per hour on intercity trains, you keep them here. Twelve, yeah, that's when you're getting. The, the, that's when you should get squeamish and try to create more capacity, and the way you should do that is. Um, building the extra miles for the high-speed trains. Why? Because the intercity trains make fewer stops. Stops make everything take longer uh, and be more expensive because um, mining out a cavern, doing a concover pit, that is money. So if so, in general, it's also something called for London and Crossrail 2, actually, because Crossrail 2 made this error of... Um, wanting to so in london they had this problem where on the southwest main line they uh uh feel like they need more capacity i mean it's not critical but they probably need more capacity at some point on the southwest main line and uh so the idea was to uh roughly build tunnels for cross for cross rail too that don't just go victoria to um uh, St. Pancras to wherever, uh, to, to going to King's Cross or Liverpool Street, or eventually Liverpool Street, uh, or the Liverpool Street network you should go, but rather also do a long tunnel, a long tunnel south of the, south of Victoria to think putting back and more than like this area um, to take over some lines. And this is a bad idea because all of these need stations and the stations are really expensive, especially in a place like London where it's difficult to get cover. Um, bits because all of these streets are very narrow. Um, no, seriously, this is, um, this is remember the meme that I mocked, the manliest man versus the... Uh, no? So, White Street in uh, London. This, for those of you keeping track at home, is, 16, uh, is a street with a number on it, making it a national highway, and it is slightly narrower than a Manhattan street, like a one-way simple east-west Manhattan Street, because these are 60 feet, so 18 meters building to building, and this is 17. This looks a little bit wider. Let's see if it matches. Uh, yeah, so in London, yeah, there's a reason that London had to invent the tunnel boring machine for the subway. Oh, wow, this is 30 meters. Like, this is kind of, this is like a Manhattan Avenue, one street in London. Wow. Yeah, so in Man so this is why London invented the tunnel boring machine for the northern line. It's because it doesn't have enough streets that can do cut and cover, and also they need to go under the Thames. Um, so no, so it's separately, yeah, London needs to do a separated northern line. Um, but they're, they, but this is not something that I'm telling people who don't know. TfL knows that the reverse branching on the northern line is a mess. The Battersea extension is supposed to resolve that in the south end, and now they're doing, or are they were planning to, and then deferred that for, I think, close reasons, work and, uh, at the Camden Town to, um, uh, to add uh, transfer, uh, to, to add the uh, underground uh, passageways for walking between the tunnels so they could separate the northern line at the northern end. Um, so what Quarter Elder should have done was just tunnel up to like Victoria, up to Victoria, maybe uh, Battersea, and then separately if you need to tunnel underneath the so so if you need fifth and sixth track on the Southwest Main Line, either uh, replace the so, so you can see that there's space near the uh, because this so you can see that this is a berm with an angle. If you turn them into retaining walls, you can make your you can create your fifth and sixth track. And if that is somehow viewed as undesirable, then A, you're wrong, but B, uh, you can put the express tracks uh, in a tunnel, because the express tracks won't need tunnels, sorry, won't need stations. Whereas um, if you're trying to do cross rail to uh, underneath these, then you need to build stations at all of these places, and that is 
fucking expensive, especially again given um, uniquely prob uniquely problematic urban geography in London. Um, so likewise, you should be considering if you're in New York and if you're thinking long term. And when it, bear in mind, when I say long term, I mean my full high speed rail crayon, not the spending high speed rail money on half a line kind of ambition that American politicians think they have. Uh, so you put the high speed tracks underneath something. Now this does not mean you need to build a new Penn Station because that would be extremely expensive. This is where you do the four line thing, where there's a where I guess between one of the I don't know between two and one, between one and three, maybe flanking one. I'm not sure. Um, and then and, and that's kind of annoying, right? Because on the west, I guess you can find some kind of Hudson thing. Okay. Maybe north of this, you could do. And it might cross under something, but that's fine. Uh, the world is three-dimensional, two-dimensional. You can slightly cut off this curve to run somewhat faster. I think you can squeeze I mean, 20 seconds out of that, 30 seconds of that. And, um, and then you can also build larger tunnel diameters so they can run 200 kilometers an hour and not deal with um, air flows around, um, around the trains. Uh, and then the problem is, what are you going to do here? right? Because I'm forbidding them to use... 30th Street, because that is just the math. Now, yeah, if for some reason that is built anyway, then, then that's easy, but a few bit, but then they're going to have to spend billions of dollars on nothing, and maybe they won't have enough left to build all of this. Uh, so if you don't, I guess you can go, you can do this weird thing where you can duck under these or something, um, and do, I don't know, a 2 by 2 on 32nd Street? I do not know to what, I mean, or uh, or do an escape thing where it can go under, or, or maybe actually 30, maybe 4 under 31st is the easiest because that's going to be Greenfield, but then you're going to be heavily weighted in this direction and the interlocking is going to look ugly, whereas if it's plunk, 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 then it's more centered. That's the part that I don't know. That's the part that I don't know with the um, four line as opposed to three line plant section. Um, and then, yeah, and then you can go wherever. Um, this is the point. So going west, you're just going on Hudson, along the Hudson, and then you find, probably you're going to do Frip, and then, like, around Secaucus is going to be probably some kind of redevelopment thing where you're going to, uh, uh, where, where, the, where it's going to be con combined with throwing away some of these buildings for TOD anyway. Um, and then you're going to be in Newark, or if you want to be really fancy, you can do uh, and cut off Newark Penn entirely. I, like, I don't think it's a good idea, but it's an idea that you can do. I just don't think it saves you very much time or money. And then here, the problem is, okay, what do you do with that? I mean, obviously you're not going to just take over. The whole point is that part of it is it creates just much more capacity because it means that these tracks are deeded to Penn Station access. So it means you can spam frequency and suddenly get way more train frequency like this. And then what do you do? I and mean, I guess you go, I mean, my, I, I, I mean, I, like my crayon is to zap the FDR um, just because the right way is available. And if you're doing tunnel boring, then it's not terribly irrelevant that it's not very wide or that it's close to the water. But all of this can be trashed, and maybe it does matter, and they need to do weird things like Yorkville or First Avenue, or it might be so difficult, it might actually be good to um, get to Queens as soon as possible or something, and then tunnel under the Hellgate, and then do as opposed to neck, neck. Um, so this is the part that needs a little more attention. I didn't know what to do. The point is to tunnel only when I need to. So not randomly carve a tunnel in the Bronx like money is no object. Uh, the whole point is to build things like money is an object. When you build things like money is not an object, you will spend a lot of money and not actually have much to show for it because everyone will want a piece of the pie. Like the point is not to do 25 kilometers from New Rochelle to Penn Station and tunnel. The point is to do I don't know this in tunnel. So like with the fact that it's not directly straight, maybe 10 kilometers without stations because again, Penn Stations going to be a separate thing. It's going to be, I don't know, 10 kilometers. It's, I don't know, a billion, I suppose. Um, even with a little bit of underwater, I mean, like, I mean, this is, when, this is how much it costs to build without tunnels. And then here are the other tunnel, I don't know, 700-ish, I don't know. Um, it's more of an underwater premium, but honestly, if you can, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, this should be about a billion dollars, but I mean, this, so Gateway, 
this without the burger line over the crown, this should be a billion dollar. Um, sorry, this with Grand Central should be maybe a billion, billion and a half. Um, and if they can do that, they can build whatever they want, right? I mean, the stations are going to be expensive, but I mean, the whole point of regional rail is, yeah, the stations are expensive, but you don't build that many stations because most of the stations are legacy suburban ones. Yeah, you build a handful of really expensive urban tavern stations like Union Square and Fulton Street on my crayon or um, things that are, or Le Al in historic Paris or uh, the Munich Esplan, both historic and what they're building right now. But the whole point is that you don't actually tunnel that much because you only tunnel city center things. Um, and if you can do it at a reasonable construction cost, then I want to say the sky's the limit, but the sky is up and this is down. So I guess the earth is the limit. Um, like you can go a lot of three dimensional cities. I mean, I, I mean, you shouldn't go crazy. I mean, Elon Musk is kind of dead at this, but this is absolutely something that you can do. Again, if you can have even minimal construction cost control, which New York City doesn't have. Now, the railways have a problem, but they're just responding to it very slowly. Um, like the United States and Europe both respond to things very slowly. The Europe, thankfully, does not have the same problem as the United States. If it did, the reaction here would be exactly as bad as in the United States. Like, it's not like... Europe, I mean, Europe is a little bit more curious than the United States, but it's not a not by a large margin, and Europeans are not that curious about the non-European world, which is why when, let's say, Taiwan is... I don't think it's COVID there anymore. I think with Omicron, which Taiwan bears zero responsibility for. Like, the, there's never... You know how there's a British variant of Alpha, an Indian variant of Delta, like a South African... I think beta, I think beta and Omicron are both South African. Maybe, I mean, maybe Omicron might be not South African, maybe Botswana. Um, yeah. Is there a... Oh, wow! 82. Taiwan has 82 domestic corona infections. Um, now, this is still less than in their alpha wave. Oh, uh, and, and they had 23 yesterday. Do you know how terrible this is that they have uh, in Taiwan... 82 domestic infections on one day. That's where I live. The, I mean, the country is about four times as large, but still, where I live, this is... Yeah. Uh, yesterday, I guess, it was a week. Again, maybe today, it's the day of the weekend effect, so... what What is the number? Uh, yeah, so in Taiwan, it's considered a big problem that they had on one day the number of infections that we in Germany have every minute. Day, minute, uh, three orders of magnitude, who cares? Uh, not like we're literally all dying of this. Um... And so, yeah, uh, so in terms of learning from Asia, uh, or even from Australia, to be honest, uh, Europe, not the best. I mean, the United States is equally bad, it's just that um, New York really needs to get over itself and learn to learn, and then learn what it should be learning. And again, the, and don't even need to build my translation crayon with three or four lines, i.e., six or eight platforms, i.e. either six aircraft carrier ducks or eight reasonably wide platforms. Uh, that means the thing it should be doing, but honestly, if they can get that, if you can get to that construction cost, and I mean, the, the, the amount of crown that New York can be building, and this is going to be in our construction cost report, which I swear will appear soon. Like, we're basically done with traditional case studies. Um, we can get a British one, like, in a time period they can even conceive. Um, New York, same. London is the one that's difficult. Um, and um, and you do that, and I mean, yeah, you can build, and one of the things we're going to talk about is what could New York build uh, if the construction costs were reasonable that well, that I can say, oh yeah, build another approach now from Penn Station to the Bronx for a billion, from Penn Station to Jersey for a billion, and that is going to be your extra two billion for high-speed rail so that it does not have to ever interact with track sharing, with anything else, right? Because you do this, and then um, once you do this with the with Amtrak, you have 
Penn Station, uh, not Penn Station, you have, yeah, we have Penn Station access, um, which you don't be sharing tracks with Amtrak. It's, they're already making this corridor for all our tracks. Um, so yeah, you're going to have a, probably a commuter train here every five minutes. And then on the Port Washington branch, let me, let me get back to the client for a moment. Uh, so every five minutes, Every, so, so with the so the point is with the with the intercity trains against every five minutes, every ten minutes, and then intercity every ten minutes. So with this, it's every five, every five intercity like this doesn't interact with this. Doesn't matter. Um, maybe you can do off hours freight on some of these. Doesn't matter. There's not that much freight, so um, fine. Uh, honestly, given, honestly, given that it's four tracks and freight can only run um, can run off hours, uh, what you should be doing is run freight at night and then. Uh, have it run on any of the four tracks, and then the other tracks that it doesn't run on are the ones that get nighttime maintenance, probably the best. Um, and then, uh, at any rate, so you do that, then uh, uh, this is four tracks. Here, this is four tracks, not six, so these are going to meet and they're going to be kind of weird. You might need to do a little bit of track sharing with the Express, but first of all, this, much of it was historically six track. Um, high speed rail for parts of this, like here, needs to be in bypasses anyway. Um, I think this is I, I think this actually fits with minimal, maybe even no track sharing between inner cities and commuter trains. And the point of not having track sharing, I mean, don't be completed. I mean, the the point of not of not having track sharing is to prevent cascading delays, um, which is useful, but. Costs money sometimes. So when you don't do it, especially with an early system like what um, I'm working on right now, um, so it's supposed to future proof it for higher future ridership. Like the concrete present day things that should be done right now with plans right now, construction to start, let's say 2024, 2025. Um, and again, it means pissing off NIMBYs, but NIMBYs in America are not as powerful as people think they are. Um, and this should not include that. It should include, again, a starter system for like four or six trains an hour with track sharing and always coordinated scheduling. Always, always, always make sure you have combined scheduling um, for literally everything. And I don't just mean the commuter trains and Amtrak, even though, yeah, these are what share track, so that's what you start with. No, I mean having a situation where you can actually write a timetable where the, the, the trains hit Waterbury or Danbury. Um, I think New Haven might be too frequent for that. And also the location, and also Union stations on the moon, but um, there's certainly things that are city centers. And again, I know this is in Massachusetts better than I in Connecticut, but in Massachusetts, I literally wrote a train timetable for the Boston to Worcester train uh, that makes sure that trains hit Worcester Union Station, which is here. And again, please don't look at the timetable, um, the or at the stations like. That's like best grand of I don't know many years ago. Like we've done better since uh, at TM. and so hits here, and even three and a half is not bad. I think we've got to something like two, um, where you have all the buses are going to converge around here every half hour, and then the train gets here every half hour in and out, and the next day after half hour more four. Um, the point is that the train is going to. Uh, have uh, you can connect from bus to train in like five minutes and it's going to be timed so it's not just interface of regional trains and intercity trains it's also regional trains and outlying city buses like like secondary city buses let's call them the buses that mostly converge at one central point so worcester has this and framingham in our plan has this um buses in framingham converge at not quite uh train at not quite uh this spot but i think like something very close to here, like say maybe 200 meters from the station. This is really important. Um, again, I mean, no, do, no, you're obviously not doing it at Penn Station. I mean, what the hell does it even mean to time transfers at Penn Station? What are you trying to make the transfer to? The subway? The subway runs every five, I mean, it should be running every five minutes off peak. It's not, and it's running every, actually, it is because the, because the uh, branches have come together. It runs every, I think, four, I think the two and three together run every four minutes off peak. Yeah. When you're running every four minutes of peak or every five minutes, you don't time transfers. People just walk and make untimed transfers every five minutes, and that's fine. You time transfers every 15 minutes, every 30, 
maybe even you know, um, brilliant time transfers every time. But like the whole point is to have this kind of total coordination. And you have this kind of total coordination with the timetable, which is what regional real network needs much more than the crayon. Like that. Um, so this crayon is the concrete. Uh, I mean, the, the map maybe depicts some kind of operational things, but really what you need is organization, which means search and destroy delays. Um, low platforms delays. Like, all of these are low platforms, rate the platform. One of these, I forget which one, is a historically landmark station. Fuck that, build high platform. Um, and uh, the uh, and you have um, some of the uh, interlockings uh, make trains cross opposing traffic, yeah. These you grade separate. You don't touch anything else. Just grade separate these. Um, if it's on a branch, if it's like a branch branch thing, here you might be able to get away with not doing that. Maybe here, I'm not sure. Here, forget about it. Like it's mainline mainline. Um, so, so by the way, um, because it's, it's crayon, the way the crayons currently work, the ones that are, on, that are colored purple is called the Mars and Essex lines. Um, they used to run like this. Some of them still do. Uh, and Manhattan Transfer is a station that has been closed since the 1930s. Um, so they run across the Northeast Corridor without transfer. Uh, and uh, they built something called the Carney Connection, which lets trains go frip, frip. This opened, I believe, in the 90s. And kind of like the reason that this tunnel is overloaded is that it used to be just going here and here. Uh, just going here and here. And then they uh, built the Carney Connection. to, and, and suddenly there was something called Midtown Direct from this part like this, and this became really powerful um, for, for, for the suburbanites, and this is what filled the trains. I mean, most trains will go here, but this is a lot of extra that helps fill. And, um, but the thing is, this Carney connection uh, requires trains here across opposing traffic here. So it's kind of like you're reduced to, for a brief moment into a single track on the Mars and Essex trunk, but then you get paired with the correct track. You don't need to cross opposing traffic from the northeast corridor, just from um, j just from this line. Uh, and even that might be might, might cause reliability problems, um, which requires spending a little bit of money. But again, it's a little bit of money. It's not um, it's not like building another tunnel or another station um, or widening the station footprint because you need space to park trains because you don't have reliable enough operations they can do mick in and out in like two minutes. Um, and so this, so again, all of this is, so, so I'm cramming pen station, but I'm cramming pen station is something that really must follow um, a program of improvement in reliability, uh, a program of improvements um, in punctuality and uh, a program of improvements in schedule integration that makes everything work together. And that will even improve Penn Station even without the rebuild. Remember how we complained at the beginning that uh, the Penn Station uh, problem, about the Penn Station problem, where here Amtrak machines, here New Jersey Transit machines, uh, and uh, here LIRR machines, and they don't even show you other railroads um, on different railroads boards, so you don't know where you're going. Yeah, that, that's something that they can end tomorrow. I mean, they can tomorrow have a, I mean, even without full integration, which you should be pursuing anyway, I mean, they, I mean, it's a solved problem to take the computer that shows you the Amtrak and New Jersey Transit board here and wire it to additional screens here, here, here. Um, and likewise, wire the LIR board with an additional board here. It'll be weird, but you can see whatever you want then. Um, and then they should work on making it a single board. Might involve a little bit of software. New York over. I mean, I wouldn't call it New York overground. I would call it New York Tanzlink. New Yorkers overrate the importance of the overground to the point that former MTA head Pat Foy said that um, in the 2000s London did not have a uh, New, New, London did not have as much commuter rail as New York City does because Pat Foy did not know that London has any kind of commuter rail other than the overground. And the overground, I think has maybe the same ridership as New York commuter rail at this point, but certainly it didn't 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and this dude had no idea that Thameslink exists, had no idea about the Northern City Line, had no idea about the vast numbers of passengers who get in on like trad commuter lines that don't have special names. They're just called the Southwest Main Line or the... Uh, 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 or the Lee Valley lines, or the uh, 
I don't know, or the London Bridge Network, I guess it was the London Bridge Network, it's partly over at this point, or the, uh, use, or, or the Watford DC line, uh, or the, or whatever you call the lines that get into uh, King's Cross. Yeah, it's, okay, so first of all, the concept you need to convince Politico specifically is by telling them that um, Annalena Baerbock is against that. You tell people, like, you, you convince the Axel Springer people that Annalena Baerbock uh, is, like, that the Greens are against um, S-Bahn tunnels, and they will um, uh, think, and they will start printing stories about how S-Bahn tunnels are the difference between uh, dystopia and utopia. This is, like, the, this is, like, the quality of analysis of Politico ever, I mean, Politico was never good, but this is the quality of analysis that Politico has had since Axel Springer took over. It's terrible. Tristead Express, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think about the branding very much, but I just call it New York Commuter Rail. Um, and yeah, people are expected to know that, yes, there's Commuter Rail, which is a line that runs three times a uh, year on trips a day all at rush hour, and there's Commuter Rail, which is the MN Hotel line. Um, I mean, in New York, the active, in America, the activists in general, like the expression regional rail, the problem is, I think of regional rail as stuff that's not specifically in very big cities. I think of regional rail as regionalbahn, which, yeah, can be in a big city, but not focus on urban service. And I'm thinking of SBAN. Um, oh, you meant politicians. Yeah, 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 yeah. Politicians, yeah, yeah, no. Um, for politicians, I don't know. I mean, there have been so many weird branding attempts. Like, there's Rethink and Why. There's, I think, something called, I want to say T Rex. Maybe the, again, there are a bunch of competing proposals. Like there's there's rethink, there's RPA. Uh, the expression RX is in Tribro RX comes from a plan from the 1990s and the third regional plan, which was called Regional Express or RX, that had centerpieces like um, uh, so in this crayon, they were going to take the uh, the the yellow colored line again. All of this from Flatbush Avenue, which is here to the east already exists, and they were going to push it here into Lower Manhattan, just for the Lower Manhattan to JFK Express. They didn't care about anything else. Um, people don't know the state's urban geography very much. Uh, from Jamaica and from here at Howard Beach, there's, um, uh, uh, there is a, driver, a driverless train operation, which is technologically the same as Vancouver Express Train, which goes... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then runs through the terminals, um, and a lot of people complain that they need to change in Jamaica rather than having a one seat ride to Manhattan, even though to Jamaica is actually better than most of these weird one seat ride plans that are being presented. Um, so it was uh, the kind of I think more important it was remarketed as a post 9/11 recovery, and it didn't happen sadly. Um, and so they just wasted money on rebuilding World Trade Center at excessive cost. And also the building is kind of empty because the center of gravity of the city just moved to midtown. And so, um, so, so the RX thing, at one point I think even Yona Framark was interning for them and proposed a skeletal the running system. Uh, and so Trigro RX, the, the original line that goes uh, flip that the uh, new governor, I'll call, uh, is backing. The, the original plan was to go existing tunnel, rip, and then new tunnels like this. Um, this was we worked up after this tunnel was filled in for bullshit reasons into rip, uh, into a kind of radial tail to Cop City, and then, uh, and now with the governor in charge and not wanting to disturb freight on the bridge to the Bronx, it's just being cut to here. Uh, you don't see, so not to here, this is the commuter rail station does not exist, but should, but here in Jackson Heights, it's a big subway connection point between the 7 and, oh yeah, 74th Broadway Roosevelt, between the 7 and the uh, EFMR trains, it's the second busiest station in Queens, the line passes very close to it, to the point that they can build a decent transfer. Um, so again, lots of uh, marketing things, I mean, I, I let politicians deal with them. I, I, I let professional marketers deal with the marketing or just saying what infrastructure needs to be built. Does that make sense? Um, so anyway, this is what needs to be done with bond section, I think. Again, the big... The, um, I mean, I'm not... And by the way, I'm serious when I'm talking about wrecking ball. Like, I mean, like, when you lose the above-ground interface, the, the above-ground infrastructure, you don't need to interface with it, and therefore you can just 
remodel the track level. Like, like do it incrementally. Like, you know, you take four tracks out of commission, then rearranging, then create two, and then turn into two tracks, and then do it with like the next four tracks at a time. And because you don't need the full 21 tracks for current traffic if you run well, um, you can just do it one at a time and not cut peak traffic to levels that people can't deal with. Um, so anyway, this is roughly what needs to be done. Um, I will take questions um, if anyone has any. So please let me know if you have questions. Um, as usual, I'm going to leave this for a little bit because people take time to type. I have a little bit of latency. And yeah. If it looks like I'm not staring at the screen, it's because I'm checking Twitter. Oh, do I have a European mega station to recommend? I mean, I want to say Berlin Hauptbahnhof. It was extremely expensive, bundled with a lot of bullshit urban renewal. But it was also a genuinely complex project. It included, for example, not one, but uh, two, I mean, one tunnel, but it was on both sides, not just one side like here. And it was not two tracks, but four tracks. It's called the Tielgarten tunnels because they go uh, in part underneath the zoo. Uh, so, um, for people who don't know Berlin, uh, oh, do I have a Euro station would like to model? No. I mean, so the thing is, America's amateur hour when it comes to mainline rail. Like, I mean, just, I, I mean, it's not that I know more than they do now. I know, I know more than they do 10 years ago. Um, so this is, uh, Hauptbahn. So like the whole point is that the S-Bahn, you kind of see the S-Bahn stations, uh, and where they lead. The S-Bahn does not hit Hauptbahnhof, it hits Friedrichstrasse. So if you're trying to make a big city center station, you need to not just have east-west trains on the, Stadt, uh, on the Stadtbahn at Hauptbahn, but also north-south. So between here and uh, here and here, they built these four-track, they built this four-track tunnel called Jagaten, which was very expensive, and it was part of it. And by the way, this is a cross, because Jagaten, like the north-south part is the Newish is, is the newer part for the Tiergarten tunnels, which are underground. The east-west is for the Stadtbahn, which is 19th century. Um, oh, yeah, Gauti Nord for Tejavet running. I mean, yeah, but first of all, I'm very conflicted on what to do. I mean, what, like, my retro crayon is that in the 1970s, when it was building Chateau Leal, instead of building aircraft carrier ducks, it should have built 10-meter platforms, and that would have created space for, I think, maybe four tracks. Uh, for extra tracks, and certainly the RERD should not have been built as a standalone, so maybe even a little more than four tracks. Ideally eight, but I don't know if they had space for that plus RERNB. Probably, but... Um, right, because, I, um, I mean, no, right? I mean, you have 17 meters, and if you make that 10, yeah, that creates 14 meters. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if they had enough space. Maybe, I don't know. So what they should have done was make this the central... Since, uh, like the central intercity station with um, the tunnels going rip, rip, uh, rip, and rip. Maybe even the two Australians and the two San if they really cared, but that's definitely overkill. I mean, not enough space, and you should just have. I mean, for commuter trains, you don't want to all funnel to one station. You want to have a web of lines that meet in triangles in city center. Um, but for intercity, you want one place. So for, but I mean, there's, I mean, essentially nothing out of San Jose's intercity. I mean, there's what laugh. I mean, who cares? Um, or still, it's the same thing. I mean, so it used to be an intercity to uh, Bordeaux and Toulouse, but then they opened the uh, LGV Atlantique, and then all the trains instead go to the Montparnasse. So anyway, what they should be, so they, they can't do it um, anymore because there's no space. But what they should have, in retrospect, done was done probably fit. Montparnasse to Est and then Lyon to No. They can't do it. I mean, what they can do is not like build the mega station here. This is what um, uh, you're talking about. Um, you were talking about when it's a mega station um, because they mentioned this before. So the idea. So first of all, there there's a lot of impetus for doing a lot of urban renewal in this part. Uh, this part of Paris has a critical flow. If you're a member of the French elite. Namely, it has black people. 
not so much black residents. I mean, I'm sure there are some black people living here, but it's mostly um, because the suburbs here are heavily black and Arab. Um, this is kind of a hangout space for black and Arab people. Um, so if you're the sort of person who thinks that the only reason anyone would ever be on a train is to shuttle on Eurostar between St. Pancras and Caldino, you are also the sort of person who's too racist to think this is okay. So um, there are also plans for urban renewal, which essentially are just Negro removal um, things. Like, in, uh, when I'm saying Negro removal, by the way, it was literally an expression used by black civil rights critics of urban renewal in the 1960s. Like, this is essentially what's being planned. And um, actually, the Amash, uh, rep, um candidates, I think both of them, for, for mayor of Paris tried to do that, but they lost, and Anita Argo has other problems, but wasting money in urban renewal, not one of them, thankfully. So, um, but there's an impetus for urban renewal, so instead of like doing something that exists purely as a pretext for having the police beat up black people until they leave, what they should be doing is turning this area into a thrift station to go as a guest snack, with tunnels going this easy, and then this is a little bit of tunneling, but not a lot. Um, and then, it's, so it's with four approach track, right? Who know, who asked? Uh, probably means eight underground tracks wherever you want. Probably S yes, is a better, I don't know. Um, and then you go, you probably want to avoid the morass of the Al. Um, so you can probably go around, and then two tracks hit Gare de Lyon, two tracks hit Montpellier. You might even have stations at both. So a TGV makes. Two Parisian stops, which can be, the, which are going to be the mega station, which is not the rest, and then Lyon if it goes like this, or and then Montparnasse if it goes like this. The thing is, like the um, SNCF has built so much infrastructure on bypassing Paris that it might, that, for example, it would orphan the bypass to the airport. Um, it would actually, it would actually reduce the quality of airport to their steady service to the point that they might need to do to Paris and then some kind of service from that. Remember, we're thinking like this, there's an RER station, and I mean, if there's an RER service, if they ran better, they could make the RER faster. They're already building multiple express lines to the airport uh, because, again, they think that the fact that the, your train to the airport is also the suburban train for black people is kind of terrible. Uh, and so that might not be the, the worst thing. I mean, I guess it disconnects you to... Um, to, to Euro Disney, but okay, for Euro Disney, okay, get off at Palais de Lyon, take a train to Euro Disney. I mean, yeah, the sort of tourists that would ever only, who don't like using a normal commuter train might dislike it, but um, I doubt a lot of tourists are using that train anyway, so. Um, this is certainly the core of the answer to your question about the TGV. I mean, it, it is, a, as I said, it is a thing, but it's an actually expensive thing, like real money, not like things that Americans think are real money but aren't. Um, and, 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 and Kevin, like, uh, I assume your name is Kevin Kahn, right? Um, so, so Kevin, um, are the people in charge moving in my direction? I don't know, I mean, Innerborough Express, I'm going to blog about it later today, I hope. Um, oh, that's what you mean, yeah, yeah. So, the Port Authority mindset, um, no, it's, it's nothing to do with, no, it's, it's before Robert Moses. I mean, the New York and New Jersey were slapping at each other three points, and the federal government compelled the creation of Port Authority for building highway, for building the Holland, the Holland Tunnel, and I'm forgetting whether the court ruling on that was late 19, was late 1910s or early 20s, but around that. Um, so no, it's not Moses. Um, the turf force, that's all, that's how traditional government works. It's all petty, it's all petty aristocrats with turf wars with, and, fief, and literal fiefdoms. It's just that in this part of the world, we've moved beyond that to some extent, and in the United States, all not. Um, so is that authority mind? Um, so to the extent, so I will say, and, and I'm going to preview the blog post that I'm hoping to write tonight, um, that the Interborough Express plan still kind of silos away commuter rail, I think, a lot. Like, still assumes that commuter rail must be unmodernized, cannot run, like, a modern S-Bahn. They cannot run, cannot, for example, have fast uh, egress at stations. Uh, cannot uh, have 
uh, precise timetabling um, can, cannot run modern rolling stock. So the so, so that mentality still exists even in a generally good plan for um, what used to be called driver and is now called Interbar Express, IBX. And um, bet and between the railroads, I mean, it's as bad as ever. The, to the extent they're doing any coordination, they're not doing coordination. They're doing a staple job, so they ask each of them for its uh, uh, for its wish list, and then they staple them together. Uh, without doing any kind of coordination, so things like a lot of unnecessary extra tracking. Not the sort of extra tracking you need to do when you run 12 trains, 12 interstate trains an hour. No, the kind you do when you run four trains an hour, but and you don't need because you're just trying to not have coordinated MBTA and Amtrak planning, or Markin Amtrak planning, or Metro North and Amtrak planning. Um, if that makes sense. So no, so no. When it comes to mainline rail, like nothing, nothing important. Sadly, I think this is the answer to the question. Um, like, do you have other questions, or do other and do other people have other questions? Like, I'm not trying to snipe. I'm trying to uh, not dwell on a on a point that people have already taken. Yeah, staple job, I mean, so for the record, when I say staple job, it's a thing that, uh, when, when I say staple job, what I mean is you literally staple a bunch of things. By the way, it's not a really terrible thing. Like, I mean, the way, I mean, it is like an expression. I mean, in this case, it is as a plan, as a plan. But Toronto, I mean, I, I mean, Jonathan English has said everything that I would like to say about what needs to be done with the Union Station. Uh, by the way, European uh, PhDs, um, often what you do is, uh, at least in math, is you write a bunch of papers in your d during your PhD, and then you staple them together, and that's your thesis. Mine is a little bit, my, mine is unusual as an American thesis, and that is somewhat like that. It's essentially two papers that are stapled, just the two papers, one of them builds on the other. Um, but for the most part, uh, Amer so American thesis are different, but European ones are staple jobs. That's completely normal. Uh, it's not... So, so the, the problem is with the staple job. Uh, so the problem with the staple job is not how you should be doing coordinated planning. Um, so anyway, are there more questions? If not, I can just try to finish it at three. Staple implies ad hoc. Yeah, it's fine to do ad hoc things. I mean, everything is a patchwork. Like everything is a patchwork in rail. I mean, like nothing, especially in mainline rail, because you can't just build in a neat, uh, like a neat radio system. You have to like use whatever you can, and everything looks ugly, and that's fine. Um, the problem is you need to be ugly like this with um, an eye to maximizing benefits and reduce and minimizing costs. Like and like in like in Switzerland, they have junctions that instead of being grade separate, they have a pocket track. Um, I mean, not when there's a lot of traffic, but yeah, sometimes in the middle. Yeah. And so the uh, so the situation is just really, do you do ad hoc things that are staple jobs or do you do ad hoc things that are, yeah, we have a million different legacy systems, so let's write down a coordinated timetable and make sure that these legacy systems somehow from time to time talk to each other. 
Um, and yeah, sure, thanks for watching. I mean, I, I keep doing these long streams, like my, my previous stream um, was also rather, was also rather long. Yeah, yeah, I mean, stable versus blending, and, oh, I see what you mean, yeah, but blending is also kind of ad hoc, right? Again, everything here is ad hoc. Even the hole in the ground fence station, I mean, something that happens to line up because it's, these are buildings that are kind of already depreciated, with the exception of Farley, which has, uh, which, which is going to be more difficult to um, dynamite for uh, historic preservation reasons. Um, hell, for all the, it's, it's kind of interesting, but also, like, in, there's kind of tendency um, to, like, show that you're committed to social justice in the United States by renaming things that used to be named after slave owners um, and, and after racists in general, and somehow Moynihan has, even though he kind of created post-1960s racism in America, still has something named after him. Um, um, would a regional Braille extension be accepted? Uh, I think so. Um, and here are my reasons. First of all, an extension to Staten Island is a complex underwater project, uh, and therefore ideally should use the highest capacity mode. So, um, you, so certainly no. So not a short. It's not the uh, light metro or light rail or anything. Minimum subway, ideally even bigger regional rail. Second, um, what would it even connect to? Um, now, there are things at Stubb and in Lower Manhattan, like the one, but the one is a very slow train, and it's also a, a, one of the narrower trains. Uh, it's uh, the IRT, the, the numbered lines are just smaller trains, and the lettered lines, aka BMT or IND. Um, the only thing that can actually hit that's lettered is the E, and the E is not in a good position to be expanded. Um, so, uh, so there's that. Um, by the way, you can do like a weird thing with like the one Governor's Island and then the Red Hook. But don't do, but, but for stuff to stand out, you want the highest capacity mode. And also you want a high speed mode. Um, so you want it to be a more express thing, just because Staten Island is far, and this and these kind of militate in favor of regional rail. For for Staten Island in lieu of a subway, if that makes sense. Um, does, does that answer your question, or do you have a follow-up? Oh, expanded path. Um, I don't see it. Um, so there is a, an extension to Staten Island that people sometimes note, which is HBLR. Uh, I don't know if it is going to be seen on this uh, map, but uh, this old line is currently used as a, as a connection to the Hudson Bergen Light Rail, which goes up, uh, and then. You see this thing; it keeps it. It's, and now it, and then it goes in the streetcar mode through um, the center of Jersey City, uh, and then it goes somehow into either Hoboken or on these disused things through a disused rail tunnel through Weehawken to around. No, not around. Dude, it's like this. Uh, this is a line that could be extended uh, on this bridge. To Staten Island. The problem is it would not hit the center. Um, so it would be like an extra thing, and likewise, you can even extend the R here. But to extend something in the Staten Island the right way, so through St. George, you should still do regional rail. It's going to be expensive, but I think it's worth it. Um, this is what I think needs to be done with paths specifically. Paths is, again, not this path. The thing about paths is it doesn't really point towards Staten Island because paths really go, go to downtown Newark. So, I mean, maybe you do an extension here, but the extension here would be HBLR, not that. Uh, does that make sense to you?
Okay, we've careened past three hours. Uh, I'm going to do a last call for questions. Um, I will spend as much time as needed if people have bigger questions about this. Um, if not, then I'll upload and see you in, in a week. And if you're watching on YouTube, yeah, sure, I've already uploaded. I'll see you when I upload the next video. Yeah, people like Pat. I mean, people like Pat. I mean, it's not going to be Pat. I mean, it's just whatever points. And, and it's kind of like, I mean, you're not going to extend Pat to, I don't know, Brooklyn, right? Because Pat points in the opposite direction. So, if there aren't any questions, thank you all for watching, whether you're on Twitch or on YouTube. Uh, and I will see you in a, in a week uh, on a topic to be decided by them. So, ciao, ciao.